Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us this evening. Um, before we start, I would like to just make a quick introduction, um, quickly introduce myself and Mary, um, as well as ELO and its mission. Um, so my name is Nadia, and together with Mary, we are student ambassadors for ELO um, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, ELO is a charity that brings together lawyers and people interested in animal protection law to achieve a better legal framework uh, for animals and also to see um, the existing um, current law to be applied more properly. ALO seeks to achieve its mission for legal advocacy, animal law education, student outreach, and other initiatives. Uh, Mary started running the Edinburgh University ALO student chapter last academic year, and last year she also organized a webinar um, dedicated to exploring UK chicken welfare, which can still be uh, watched on YouTube. Um, I have joined Mary this academic year, and we have sought to promote um, ALO's work for social media and also on our new LinkedIn blog. Um, all the links to our sites will be provided um, in the chat box if anyone is interested. Um, I will hand it over to Mary, who will uh, quickly outline the aims of the event and will introduce our first speaker. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today, and thanks for introducing me, Nadia. I'm Mary. Um, so welcome to a deep dive, exploring the facts behind UK fish and crustacean welfare. Tonight we're joined by Colin Brown, Dr. Jonathan Birch, Paula Sparks, Amro Hussein and Claire Howard for an exploration of the sentience and behaviour of fish and crustaceans, as well as an exploration of some of the legislative campaigns advocating for change um, for these animals. There's also going to be a Q&A at the end of tonight's event, so please do pop any questions you have for our speakers in the Q&A box. Just make sure that you don't pop them in the chat box uh, because we might not be able to find them amongst all of the messages. So I'd like to begin by introducing Colin Brown, uh, who I'd like to sincerely thank you for being here this early. I believe it's four in the morning for him right now. And Cullum's made a significant contribution to the study of behavioural ecology of fishes over his research career. His research niche lies in the study of fish behaviour and its application to fisheries science and conservation. Cullum is a well-known champion of fish intelligence, ethics and welfare. All but six of his 150 plus peer-reviewed papers and one of his 15 book chapters have fishes as the primary focus and he is in the top 2.5% of researchers in ResearchGate. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it over to Colin now. Thanks, thanks for having me. And I'll try and share my screen. Can I do that if you stop sharing first, perhaps? There we go. All righty. Yes, four o'clock in the morning, but that's actually not unusual. <laughs> I've got students all over the world, uh, so it's often it's often the case that we work in odd hours, uh, especially nowadays that we we zoom we seem to zoom everything, <laughs> which is cool. All right, so this uh, this talk is largely about um, uh, fish cognition and its implication for welfare, and I'm also going to touch on pain and emotion in particular. So I think perhaps the, 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 one of the perhaps the best ways to start is by uh, that's odd. There we go. Uh, is just by thinking about why we might care about uh, fishes at all. And I guess the, the first thing to note is that humans interact with fishes across a, a huge range of contexts, um, not least of which, of course, is commercial fishing, which is still a major source of protein for many human populations around the world. And it's one of the few sources of, of uh, human protein that's sourced from the wild still. Of course, traditionally we, we did a lot of hunting, but that's no longer the case. Nearly everything of course is uh, reared in uh, controlled conditions. And of course, we've done such an awesome job at fishing the daylights out of the oceans that uh, their stocks are collapsing around the world. And in fact, a, a few years ago, um, aquaculture overtook and commercial fishing from the wild in, in terms of the source of, of fishes for human consumption. So that's a, a major shift in how we use uh, fishes. Of course, recreational fishing is hugely popular pastime around the world. And it may surprise people to find that fishes are actually the most numerous pet 
uh, in the world as well. And in terms of scientific research, fishes are, are rapidly increasing, not just because we're using them for uh, aquaculture research, but also things like zebrafish are overtaking the rat and mice in even medical research. So human medical research is increasingly using zebrafish and, and similar models to understand human behavior, human neurophysiology, and even responses to various drugs that will ultimately be used on people. Uh, and of course, um, because of that, their numbers are rising rapidly. And if you're interested in vertebrate diversity uh, or even biodiversity in general, there are more species of fish than all the other vertebrates combined. So the number now is somewhere in the order of 36,000 described species. So there's a lot of fish and we interact with them in, in a lot of different ways. Probably before I start talking about sentience, <laughs> I just wanted to note what it means to me. Um, so sentience to me is just the capacity to feel. And you may well ask, well, what does that mean? Well, it's really to feel anything. It could be neutral. It could be violence. Um, so it's all about uh, emotions and things that are going on in animal minds. And that, that's kind of important because if they have the capacity to feel things, then, of course, we have some sort of moral obligation to, to protect them uh, wherever we come across uh, cruelty or, and what have you. And this idea of um, protecting um, animals because they're sentient has a long history, particularly in Europe. You can go back to the Treaty of Lisbon in 2008. And so that whole concept is well and truly embedded in how the EU works generally. Uh, and then, of course, New Zealand, um, closer to me, recently recognised animal sentience. The Australian Capital Territory did in 2019. And, of course, the UK has, has just done so as well. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, studying fish cognition is that people are constantly amazed uh, whenever we release some of our papers and the media gets hold of them. Everybody's like, oh, my God, fish, fish don't have a three-second memory. And people are always shocked by that uh, over and over and over again, which is kind of ironic in a way, because it seems to me that perhaps the, the media and, and, and the, the general public have a three second memory about fish cognition, which is rather ironic. But the general idea is that that fishes, you know, they swim in this bowl and they swim round and round and round. And of course, by the time they've reached the other side, that is, they've done a lap, they've completely forgotten everything. And of course, they, they, they have to spend their life in perpetual exploration. And one only has to think of this classic uh, character, Dory, from Finding Nemo, one of my favorite uh, movies, to realize just how silly that concept is. You know, Dory suffers from short-term memory loss and she hasn't got a clue what's going on. And it's pretty obvious to everyone, including my little kids, that this, this animal wouldn't stand a chance in the real world if it didn't have some capacity for learning and memory. And of course, the reality is, the scientific reality is, we've known that fish are extremely intelligent animals for a really long time. Um, I personally have been studying fish cognition for 25 years, uh, and it was a bit of a um, I guess a surprise to everybody how smart fish were 25 years ago, but you would think by now uh, that uh, that message would have sunk in. But nonetheless, we are spending an, an awful amount of time and effort trying to convince the, the general public uh, that fish are in fact smart. Um, so they're way smarter than, than the general public think. And here's just a list of some of the, um, I guess, some of the things that people would generally uh, associate with uh, cognition and, and intelligence more broadly, perhaps. And, um, I, you know, over the last 10 years or so, not only have uh, fishes been shown capable of doing all these things, but in fact, they've often led the research, the scientific research into understanding not only how they evolve, but how they work, what the mechanisms are, and so on and so forth. So this, this is a list that we used to think was unique to humans, but in fact, you know, over the years, it's proven not to be the case. So perhaps some of the best places to start by busting the myth is to just show you that you know, fish are smart and they can learn things really, really quickly. So just, if you just think about uh, classical conditioning, everybody's heard of Pavlov's dogs, or this is the Pavlov's dogs experiment, in, except in fishes. And you can see there's a bunch of rainbow fish in, in this. And what I basically do is every time this flashing light comes on, some food is delivered down this pipe. And you just, you just have to look to see how quickly it takes the fishes to associate this strange flashing red light in their environment uh, with the arrival of, of food. And you can look at different species that have been reared in different conditions and so on and so forth. But this is kind of a, a summary of, of what that might look like. And here you can 
the the rate at which the fishes learn um, so this is their anticipation of, of that food arriving shortly after the um, flashing light came on. And you can see that these wild crimson spotted rainbow fish learn this really quickly by just perhaps eight or so exposures. They've totally figured that out. And you can see there's a bit of a morning afternoon uh, lag as well. And that's because they're, they're just more motivated uh, to feed overnight. You know, first thing in the morning, they haven't been fed for quite some time. So they're a bit more motivated. So the wild fish do this really quickly. And then you can see the captive fish, uh, they're a little bit more silly, but they do eventually figure it out. And there's another species of captive fish here, but this is the general thing that you see that the fishes learn it really quickly, irrespective of where they, they're from. But generally speaking, wild fish tend to be smarter uh, than captive reared fishes. Um, so that's learning. And a few years back, um, I was interested in um, teaching fishes to swim through a, a, this model trawl apparatus. And that I, I started using this apparatus because I was teaching third year fishery students about how trawlers work. And um, we had an escape route in this particular net as it was drawn down the aquarium. And you can see here, the, the fishes learn where that escape route is really, really quickly by just four exposures. So they're not only learning this seemingly artificial uh, avoidance task, but what is more amazing is we put the fish aside for an entire year and then tested them again. And you can see that actually they carry on as if you'd done 10 trials in a row. Uh, they, they improve, they continue to improve. Um, so that was uh, some of the you know, really good experimental evidence that fish not only learn quickly, but they retain this information, which seemingly arbitrary things that I'd taught them for an amazing amount of time. These, these rainbow fish, this is actually an endangered rainbow fish that I was working on at the time. They only live for you know, two or three years in the wild. So you know, we've done this you know, 10, 15 minute training uh, on this artificial task, and they retain that information for an amazing amount of time. Something that's slightly a bit more complicated, I guess, is this concept of time place learning. And that's where you learn to be at a particular location at a particular time. Of course, for humans, our entire lives is controlled by time place learning. You have to be at certain places at certain times all the time. And that's also true of animals. And that's because um, important biological events are predictable in terms of the time and place that they occur. So it's important that animals learn those sorts of things. And in this particular experiment, all we did is we fed uh, a, a bunch of aquariums um, at different times and at different places. So there's basically nothing the fish could learn in that concept. And you can see that their distribution in the fish tank is completely random. But in this other um, black line here, the test condition, we actually fed them at one end of the aquarium in the morning and the other end of the aquarium in the evening. And once again, we just looked to see just before the food is delivered what the distribution of the fish in the aquarium is. And anybody who has an aquarium at home will have noticed this. The fish learn very quickly to wait at the appropriate time and the appropriate place to be fed. Um, so that's perhaps not all that surprising. They can do that with predators as well. So one of the interesting things about fishes, of course, is that they're kind of renowned for schooling. They live in schools, these big schools, and that raises, I guess, two questions. The first is, can they tell one another apart? And the second is, can they learn from one another? So rather than learning independently, as we've just seen, perhaps they can also learn uh, socially. And I guess the, the short answer to that is, yes, they can. And they're, they're very good at social learning and indeed recognizing other individuals. Here's some really nice uh, early experiments where Basically, random fishes that had never met before were put together in these to form these little schools. And over a period of time, as they became increasingly familiar with the individuals within their school, the experimenters took out individuals and asked them, well, do you want to spend time with these schoolmates that we've just created for you? Or do you want to spend time with these random individuals on the other side of the, uh, the fish tank? And you can see that within about 12 to or so days, the fish start to differentiate between strangers and the familiar individuals. So it's just like us, we go into a party, we like to spend time with people we know, we tend to gravitate socially towards them, fish do the same thing. And more interestingly, perhaps, is that you can see over here that the fishes, after they'd been isolated again for a further 12 days, they still maintain uh, this strong preference for uh, gravitating towards familiar individuals in a social context. And in fact, another PhD student tested fish uh, after three weeks of isolation, and they still found that the, the fishes had this strong preference socially for familiar individuals. So they avoid strangers, and they like to spend time with individuals that they know.
one of the interesting things about the social behavior of fishes is that because they're social, you know, generally speaking, we in, in experimental conditions, we, we tend to, to focus on this within generation uh, learning context where, you know, animals are doing sort of peer to peer learning, if you like. But actually, a lot of learning also uh, occurs across generations. So that's between fishes you know, of, of various different age groups. And uh, much of the work that we've looked at also shows that you know, bigger fish, older fish, um, more driven fish who seem to know what they're doing tend to be leaders and are followed by uh, other fishes. So we started looking at, this is some of the work I did it, um, when I first moved to Cambridge. I was uh, looking at whether or not these baby Atlantic salmon, which I read in hatcheries and can completely clueless about the world, could they learn to recognize live uh, prey items? So they've never seen live food before. And here it's a very simple setup. We basically have a demonstrator fish on one side that's been pre-trained to recognize this uh, food, this live food, it's actually a little worm. And along here, you can see how quickly after we've delivered that food to the system, does the animal strike at that prey item and consume it? And these are the trained demonstrators, which is always good because the trained demonstrators are actually demonstrating what we want them to do. And that is that almost as soon as the worm shows up in their environment, they're, they're striking at it and eating it, which is what a, a wild fish would do. Now, the pink line here is, a, is, a, is perhaps the most interesting from our perspective. And that is where you have a naive individual placed on the, on the other side of a clear partition. And these guys actually get to watch the other guys on the other side eating this worm, and then they get the opportunity to eat it themselves. And you can see that within just six trials, they're almost indistinguishable from uh, these pre-trained demonstrators. So they learn socially very, very quickly. Just for comparison, this is a, a single individual placed by itself, and it, it takes a long, long time for a single individual to figure it out. They eventually do. It's about 10 or 15 trials at least, uh, sometimes up to 20. Um, uh, but perhaps even more interesting is this uh, negative social control. So this is where you have two fish side by side, but neither of them have a clue what's going on. Uh, and in fact, what happens here, instead of getting social, positive social feedback, you get negative social feedback. So they they're actually feeding off the fear response towards the, the um, food reward, which sounds a little bit weird, uh, rather than the positive uh, feeding response that you get from a trained demonstrator. And it takes two naive uh, individuals forever to figure out that you can actually eat this thing, that they're actually feeding off each other negatively. Um, so that's interesting. You get positive and negative uh, social reinforcement of behavior. Now, you may well ask, well, how does that relate to cross-generational or, or cultural traditions developing in animals and indeed fishes? And, and this is one experiment uh, Kerry William did with Kevin Leyland. And here they're using guppies. And all they did was they pre-trained a bunch of demonstrators to arbitrarily access a food reward by either going through a red door or a green door. Now the travel distance is identical, it makes no difference actually in terms of the distance travel, whether you go through one door or the other to access the, the foraging patch. Uh, but you can see that uh, when you have half the population um, trained with a bunch of naive demonstrators, about half, there's an extremely strong preference for the pre-trained door, it's completely arbitrary. Then we start to remove these pre-trained individuals from the population. And this, the idea of this is it's supposed to simulate the loss of knowledgeable individuals from, from the, um, the, the local population. And what's interesting is that after some days, there are none of the original trained individuals left in the population, right? So here it's completely all naive individuals that are uh, present and they still have this very strong preference for this arbitrary selection of using one door or the other and that carries on for some time so that, that clearly shows that you can train fishes in the lab to develop these artificial cultural preferences for things like foraging routes now that may seem completely artificial but in fact it mimics the sorts of things that one sees in the wild and this is a really nice experiment you'd never get permission to do this these days and in this case, Helfman and Schultz, they actually uh, translocated entire populations of um, these French grunts. Uh, French grunts are a pretty cool little beasties. They spend their daytime resting and sleeping amongst urchins. And then during the day, uh, as the end of the day approaches and dusk is falling, uh, 
they migrate out along these very specific routes um, to find their preferred foraging patch. And every single little sort of subpopulation of these things has this unique hiding locations that they, they rest in during the day and unique foraging locations somewhere out on the reef. And they move back and forth as, as dusk falls as well. So by the time they're the, you know, morning again, they're already resting. And these guys watched uh, these populations and they noticed that when new individuals recruited into these little groups, they seem to follow everybody else along this path. And there's all sorts of idiosyncrasies about how they move and how they, and then how they find these locations. So what Helfman and Schultz did is they translocated these groups of animals between locations. And in some places, they left some of the residents. Um, so some of the original inhabitants were left there. And when that happens, the translocated individuals follow along the, the route that the residents are using. So they adopt the same migration path, daily migration path back and forth to these foraging grounds. But if you remove the uh, resident population entirely, the translocated fish just go off on a random direction. Um, and in fact, it's somewhat reminiscent of the direction they would have taken uh, had they still been at, at, at home. Um, so that really strongly shows that many of these um, migrations and movements of, of fishes over both small and large distances, both for foraging and feeding and overwintering and all sorts of important behaviours are in fact uh, culturally transmitted. And one of the, I guess, more cool things that we've been looking at over the, over the years is tool use in fishes. Um, and perhaps everybody will be aware of archer fish. Archer fish are these cool native fishes to Australia where they squirt water um, like a pistol, I guess, and they dislodge terrestrial insects above the stream. And they have to actually learn what that trajectory is and also anticipate where the insect is going to fall. And anybody who's ever tried to spearfish anything through water will know that, of course, the light bends as it enters the water. So it's a quite a difficult thing to learn. But the, the baby archerfish learn this really, really quickly. Um, and more interestingly, a few years ago, we uh, published a paper that was looking at uh, tool use in, in a whole bunch of tusk fish. And in this case, they, they grab these huge uh, bivalves, which they're quite incapable of opening um, themselves physically. They're just too tough. But what they do is they take them to these very specific anvils and they just smash the daylights out of these things on the anvil by repeatedly whacking them against these anvils. And of course, there's this midden of broken shells. There's a bunch of scroungers that are hanging around as well, waiting for a free meal. So this behavior, as it turns out, is really widespread. Soon after we published this paper, we had people ringing us and emailing us from all over the world saying, oh my God, I've seen exactly the same thing. Uh, a slightly different species, but you know, sometimes in the Caribbean, uh, sometimes in the Red Sea, uh, but all over the world. And it turns out that this group of fishes are, are really, really good at uh, using anvils. So I think that gives you a quick overview of how intelligent fish really are and the sorts of behaviors that they're capable of. And I think the important thing is that there's this gap between public perception of fish intelligence has really serious implications for how we interact with fish and not just because public opinion drives animal welfare legislation, but also there's this concept that you know, ethics, intelligence, and sentience are all wrapped up together in some way. And that's partially because people are more likely to show empathy towards animals that they think are smart. Now, fortunately, it's also the case that smart animals tend to have a greater capacity for um, suffering as well. So that's nice that it's all wrapped up. But the important thing is that it's you've got to change public opinion before anything real happens. Uh, look, in terms of how many numbers of fish we're talking about here, it's kind of very difficult to get actual numbers. So you know, what are the implications for, for knowing that fish are, are intelligent? And it's very difficult to know uh, in terms of the numbers. There's no real numbers for companion animals. It seems crazy. How many pet fish are there in the world? Actually, no one really knows. There's some idea that's gained um, from trade. So how many fish are actually shipped around the world? So that's really the only way we know. And the, the estimate around it is at the moment is about 1.5 billion individuals um, per annum. But it's very difficult to get good numbers on that. Research numbers, well, there's many more millions than five, um, but again, very difficult to get numbers on that. 
Best estimate for aquaculture is about 100 billion individuals per annum. Recreational fishing, about 10 billion if you do the maths. And, you know, commercial fishing, again, this is only based on numbers uh, reported by the FAO, but it's somewhere between one and three trillion individuals. And that doesn't include bycatch and all sorts of individuals uh, that uh, would not be um, summed in those statistics. So look, we're talking about a huge number of individual fishes. And if you compare that to the terrestrial animals that are killed for human consumption, suddenly the terrestrial um, disaster seems trivial. There's about a thousand times more individual fishes that are slaughtered for human consumption, uh, just for human consumption, let alone all those other uses that I was talking about. Um, so what's interesting about that is, you know, in the 70s, there was this really big push um, by the public to protect the welfare of animals, um, particularly in a sort of uh, um, industrialized agricultural setting. And for whatever reason, that never really made it to fish. And they sort of fell off the radar, as it were. And even today, although increasingly fish are included in, in animal welfare legislation around the world, even in those places where it is included in the welfare legislation, uh, there's very little effort in terms of actually protecting them when it comes to enforcing the law. Uh, so this seems to be the case that we have this brilliant idea about you know how all the animals are all protected and living happily one with one another um, it's clearly the case that that uh, that sort of level of protection never really made it to fishes one of the hot topics i think that's been um, somewhat controversial over the years is whether or not fish are capable of, of feeling pain and, and quite frankly the simple answer is yes the reason that you and i feel pain at all is because we inherited all the mechanisms from our fishy ancestors um, so the debate really is no longer about whether they um, have no susceptors or not is that can they detect negative stimuli at all we put that to bed in about 2002 2003 um, it's really now about how they respond on an emotional level. Are they emotionally engaged with pain? So this is kind of the, the true definition of pain. It's that emotional uh, suffering that's associated with it. And since the 60s, there's been this anti-fish pain league, I call them, that are primarily driven by wreck fishing and associated injury, um, in industries that have really argued that since humans use the, their cortex, at least partially for processing pain, that would suggest that any animal that doesn't have a human cortex can't feel pain. This is the kind of no cortex, no cry approach. Of course, the trouble with this argument, apart from the completely egocentric perspective that it comes from, is that it completely ignores the evolutionary history of the vertebrate brain and you know, the capacity of other animals uh, to process the same information in slightly different ways. And don't even get me started with convergent evolution. That doesn't even come into the argument, which is kind of striking. So to illustrate just how naive this structure function fallacy is, I kind of use this analogy. This is the no cortex, no see analogy, which I think most people could relate to. And you know, humans use their cortex also for vision. And it would be bordering on the ridiculous to suggest that any animal that doesn't have a human-like cortex can't see. I mean, that's a, it's exactly the same pain uh, con argument, but in, in a slightly different context. But of course, over the last 20 years or so, we've recognized that um, fishes um, have a pretty well-developed forebrains, including paleo regions, which seem to do um, much the same functions as the sorts of things that are happening in the cortex. But let's not forget that the cortex is also stolen. Many of the functions from various other parts of the brain uh, over its uh, evolutionary history. So rather than concentrating on how the human brain works, let's perhaps spend a little bit of time thinking about why, why we feel pain at all. Um, and I, my perspective is that it's really important and particularly the emotional components of pain is really important. They're a highly conserved unit. And the first part of it is the, the simple reflex, right? So you touch something hot and you withdraw that. There's no real cognition or emotion going on there. That's an, an automated response, fair enough. But I would argue the most important part actually is this second component, which is learning and memory. That is the, where the emotive component um, reinforces learning. So you have to have emotional engagement for this long-term reconciliation, a little consolidation, if you like. Um, so if you didn't have that, of course, if you, if you didn't have this emotional um, response, that reinforcement to, to remember that context X or object Y is dangerous, having been burnt, you would literally turn around and walk straight back into the fire. So from an evolutionary perspective, you know, that's a bit of a dead end scenario. Uh, so most animals, of course, would have this uh, capacity um, to respond to painful stimuli in, in, in important ways. And you can see it 
everywhere in the fish world. So here you can see sticklebacks that have developed spines. Why do they have spines? Or same with Daphnia, because when a predator bites down, it hurts. Uh, and of course, the predator will try to eject that in an individual from their mouth as quickly as possible. There's some fantastic YouTube videos on showing pike trying to eat sticklebacks and getting a spine stuck in their mouth. Um, jellyfish, of course, have stingers. Well, they use those not only to protect themselves, but also to catch prey. And in fact, um, Here's a, a clownfish. He's hiding amongst these um, stinging tentacles of an anemone. And in fact, clownfish have an extra thick layer of mucus to protect them from those stinging cells. And of course, it keeps everything else away from them. So the very reason they're hiding uh, is precisely because the stinging cells uh, hurt and keep animals at bay. So how do we measure pain in, 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 in humans? It's actually a very difficult thing to do. And we actually have no way of quantifying pain in humans. So if you go to a doctor, what do they do? They say, oh, how does that feel? On a scale of one to 10, how does that feel? That's basically how sophisticated we are in terms of measuring pain in, in people. So you can imagine the complications when it comes to measuring pain in, in even children and, and, and uh, animals that can't respond verbally in, in some sort of meaningful way. So what do we do? We don't get them to respond verbally. We rely on these signs and symptoms. Anybody who's ever done first aid will know. You look for the signs and symptoms and you assess those. So of course, Animals and, and children will be, you know, showing withdrawal, they lose their appetite, they might become aggressive, they might be uh, protecting their, the area that's painful, uh, they might go off their food for long periods of time, their breathing rate will go off, they'll be crying or limping or something. There's, there's a load of different traits that one could use to determine uh, whether an animal or a, or, or a child is in pain. And of course, that's a pretty easy thing for everybody to do. Here's a reasonable list of things that you might reasonably associate with um, pain in, human, in humans and other animals. And what I really want to point out here is not that just how many experiments have been done over the years, but the main thing is that you know, the information that we have for mammals and fishes is, is about the same. So we know just, a bit, just as much about um, pain and how it works in fishes in terms of experimental approaches that, than we do in, in, uh, in, in animals and mammals, and you know, even more so than we do in birds. And what you'll see is that many of these things are you know, physiological or, or what have you in nature, but a lot of them are behavioral. And the ones down the bottom uh, are clearly more complicated than these simple reflexes that you often hear. Just to give you an illustration of what some of these things look like, um, this is some classic work by Lynn uh, when we were working together at the uh, University of Edinburgh. And here she just injected um, these trout in the mouth with either a control, so they're just handled, or a saline injection, or uh, this is bee venom. Everybody can relate to what that feels like being bitten by a bee. And this is a mild uh, acidic acid solution. You can see the amount of time it takes to start feeding is hugely higher uh, in these animals that are in pain of some sort. There are other physiological um, measures as well. Here's a change in activity when they're in pain, their activity declines from a baseline, their percular beat rate, that is how quickly their breathing goes up. And what's interesting here is that when you apply a, a local anesthetic, their behavior starts approach, uh, approaching uh, background levels or control levels. This is an interesting experiment too. This is just shows you how complicated some of the decision-making processes can be. In this experiment, the fish is moving around in this environment. It may have a friend or not on this side behind a barrier. And if they get into this zone, they get zapped by electricity. And uh, what you can clearly see is that when they're given a choice um, between being zapped and, or, or getting access to their mates, they actually really strongly um, prefer hanging out with their mates. And you can, there's a bit of a horrendogram, but when there's no fish present, they get zapped, they avoid the zapping area. So this is the far side of the aquarium. They obviously avoid it and they get as far away from that zap as possible. But when there's a friend present, they do the opposite. They're, they're drawn towards the area where their mates are, uh, even though they're being zapped. And in fact, after they've been zapped, they even have a stronger preference for that. And that's because fish have this compelling uh, need to spend time with other individuals to school when they're feeling pain or, or threatened. 
So this concept of this negative emotion that's driving behavior was really, I guess, first brought forward by Charles Darwin in his um, really cool book, Expressions of Emotions of Men in An and Animals. It's worth actually reading this. And he proposed that these emotions are adaptive. So they're, they're not only uh, a way of motivating behavior, but might even be a way of communicating our private internal um, states. Of course, there's a whole bunch of emotions that we feel and all of them are associated with behavioral and physiological changes that we can measure. You don't have to ask people if they're angry, you can tell. And what's interesting, I think, is that at the fundamental level, emotions guide animal behavior by rewarding um, um, positive behavior and discouraging behavior that results in punishment. Um, so one of the interesting things about uh, the fishes in the fish brain that we've learned over the years is that they actually have specific parts of their brain, just as humans do, that are associated with emotional learning and emotional responses. So for example, the median pallium up here is specifically uh, involved in learning about negative uh, emotional con um, con con uh, conditions. You can also use our improved understanding of how the brain works to uh, affect our cognition in animals. And that's increasingly been done um, in terms of using cognitive bias to get a feeling about whether an animal is optimistic or pessimistic. So they do, do they see a half glass of water and think it's half full or half empty? And on, these are the sorts of experiments that you do. You can train them to, towards a, a positive and avoid a negative um, uh, associated um, color or context or location. And then you give them an ambiguous um, um, signal. And the question is, do they approach that or, or do they avoid it? And that tells you whether they're uh, optimistic or pessimistic. Now, this has increasingly been done in, in terrestrial animals. It has yet to be done in fishes, but the experimental setup is, is very, very simple. So I think um, what we can now know, I, I suggest, is that not only do we understand how the fish cognition works, um, uh, we can probably move to a position now where we know so much about how uh, this works that we can look to not only avoid negative welfare in fishes, but encourage uh, positive um, welfare in fishes. It's a bit of a daunting task. We're talking about 36,000 species of fish. In, in captivity alone, in aquaculture, it's about three, 300 species that are used intensively. So it's a pretty daunting task, uh, but one I think that we will have to embark on. So that's a quick uh, conclusion summary slide and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Callum. That was a fascinating presentation. I personally didn't realize um, how intelligent fish really were and the extent to which they feel pain. I feel like it really highlights the need for further protections um, in this area. Thank you very much. Um, I will now um, introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Jonathan Birch. And Dr. Birch is an associate professor of philosophy at London School of Economics and principal investigator on the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. Um, in 2021, he led a review of the evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod uh, crustaceans uh, that led to invertebrate animals, um, including crabs and lobsters being included in the UK government sentient bill. Um, and his first book, um, The Philosophy of Social Evolution, was published um, by Oxford University Press in 2017. Thank you. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Nadia. And uh, thanks to you and to Mary for the invitation. Wonderful to, to speak at this fantastic webinar on such an important topic. And also thanks very much to, to Cullum for the, the fantastic talk that preceded this one. It's a shame we can't do this event in person so that we could have Cullum here in the UK and we could we could actually give him a proper round of applause, but we can we can say thank you. So Nadia asked me to talk about um, the report that I led last November, the review of the evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans. Um, it sort of forms part of my, my longer term project. I lead a project called the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project at the LSE that aims to investigate how we can study the subjective feelings of animals scientifically and how we can put the science of animal sentience that I think is an emerging, exciting interdisciplinary research field, how we can put that science to work to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals. So it's not all about uh, crustaceans 
and mollusks, but this particular report was. We were invited by DEFRA to review evidence specifically relating to those two taxa. Now, if you want to read the report, just go to bit.ly slash sentience report. And if you want to see these slides, if they go past a bit quickly, just go to bit.ly slash sentience slides. So I was working on this report with various co-authors, including Charlotte Byrne from the Royal Veterinary College, Alex Schnell, um, a brilliant cuttlefish specialist at the University of Cambridge, my postdocs, Andrew Crump and Heather Browning, a team ranging across animal welfare science, comparative cognition, experimental biology, and, uh, and philosophy and ethics. And we were asked to review the evidence of sentience in two specific taxa of invertebrates. I'll explain in this talk the basic approach we took to the issue, and I'll say something about our findings, though I'll have to go very quickly in reviewing what our findings were. And I'll talk about the recommendations that arose from our report. And as I say, if you want to find more detail on any of these things, read the executive summary or even the whole report. So sentience, as we defined it for the purposes of our report, is the capacity to have feelings. It's from the Latin for to feel. It's good to work with a broad definition like that, I think. The capacity to have feelings that might include feelings of pain, pleasure, hunger, thirst, warmth, joy, comfort and excitement. It's not simply the capacity to feel pain. It's not even simply the capacity to feel pain or pleasure. But we do recognize that feelings of pain, distress, harm, broadly understood, what Cullen was calling valenced experiences in his talk, valence because they have a positive or negative quality, have a special significance for animal welfare law. And I think it's particularly the negative side, in fact, that animal welfare law has traditionally focused on. It's focused on ameliorating serious welfare problems. So we wanted to recognize that because it does seem as though pain does have this special ethical significance, while at the same time emphasizing that sentience should be broader than that. And I, and I think a large part of the appeal of this concept of sentience to people in the animal welfare world is the fact that it is broader than just talking about pain and suffering all the time. It does include things like the capacity for joy, comfort, excitement. It includes the positive side of mental life as well as the negative side. We were focusing on these two taxa, the cephalopods or, or cephalopods, a class of invertebrate animals containing octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, and nautiloids. Alex Schnell, who we were working on the report with, is quite a brilliant uh, photographer of these animals. And the decapod crustaceans, which are a pretty large order of invertebrate animals of the crustacean subphylum, so not accounting for all crustaceans by any means, um, but including some of the, the largest and most cognitively sophisticated crustaceans, including the true crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and shrimps. How do you approach a question like, you know, are these animals sentient or not? It's a huge question. Traditionally, the decapods have not really been protected in, in any explicit way in UK animal welfare law at all. Cephalopods, by contrast, have been protected by the Animals Scientific Procedures Act, so protected in science for a while, but not protected outside of science. How do we approach this issue? I mean, here are some thoughts of the guiding principles that, that were on our minds as we were writing this report. One is about the need to integrate evidence from multiple sources. You're getting a more robust case one way or the other, you're looking at multiple kinds of evidence, including behavior and neural evidence and cognitive evidence. And we're looking for processing that goes beyond mere reflexes. If you touch a hot stove, your hand will recoil, but it's a reflex and it's controlled peripherally. And the experience of pain really has nothing to do with that withdrawal of the hand from the stove. The experience of pain happens afterwards and obviously depends on the brain. So the difficulty here in looking for evidence of sentience is to look for processing that is going beyond mere reflexes, 
and that does involve centralized integrative processing like experiences of pain do in us. Another guiding principle was the need to communicate uncertainty, but I don't think we're in an area where we're talking about conclusive evidence, total certainty. I don't think that's um, the sort of language to be using for any animal really, uh, in that certainty just isn't the right word. It's always possible to doubt. It's possible to doubt of other human beings. Are they really feeling the same thing as I do? Do I have much more intense pleasures than everyone else? Do I have much more intense pains? Are other people really feeling what I'm feeling when I'm feeling pain? You can entertain these doubts about other people. So of course you can also entertain these doubts about animals, but we need to recognize that our failure to achieve certainty in this area does not imply a lack of evidence. It doesn't mean we can't form evidence-based judgments. The difficulty is to communicate uncertainty in a way that shows the judgments are still being guided by evidence. In our report, we developed a framework of confidence levels to do that. That's inspired by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, that faces very similar problems of how to communicate uncertainty. Because if you say, well, I'm not really certain how bad global warming is going to be, policymakers might take that as an excuse to say, oh, you're not certain then, so there's no such thing as global warming. And of course, that's not the case. There's a huge amount of evidence that sometimes falls short of complete certainty in some areas. So the IPCC has a framework of you know, standardized terminology of terms like very low confidence, low confidence, medium confidence, high confidence, very high confidence, to convey the quality and the amount of evidence in support of some claim. So in our report, we developed uh, a similar framework for talking about the evidence of sentience. And another guiding principle was the need to reach overall judgments that relate to that evidence in a clear and precise way. I think if you read the report, we did you know, put quite a lot of work into making our you know, the rationale for our judgments as clear as they possibly could be, and to have a clear framework for how we would move from evidence to an overall recommendation. Another principle was that, as I emphasized, your sentience is more than just pain. Sentience is all subjective feelings, including the positive side of mental life. At the same time, we needed to balance that against the fact that there's been a traditional focus on pain in debates about animal welfare law, but also reflected in the scientific evidence itself that there's more evidence relating to states like pain than there is relating to states like joy or excitement and so on. And our report ultimately reflects that. A lot of the evidence we discuss is relevant to pain, even though sentience is not just pain. And what we wanted to do is start with existing lists of indicators of sentience, of, of which you know, there are many. Colm's talk earlier featured one. Lists of this type of guided policy in this area in the past, including the formulation of the Animal Scientific Procedures Act. So we wanted to start with that and, and stay close to precedent in that respect, but also try and improve and expand the list of indicators, essentially to modernize it and make it less, I suppose, mammal centric, I think. Because some sometimes, for example, you see criteria that are about responsiveness to opioids and that's really very specific to you know the fact that a particular drug has a certain effect in uh, vertebrates we shouldn't necessarily expect opioids to have the same effects in crabs and octopuses as they do in mammals so we wanted to remove specific references to aspects of vertebrate physiology but nonetheless still have a very robust set of criteria. This was the list we ended up with. It involves, you know, possession of nociceptors by itself is not sufficient for experiences of pain, but it is a relevant part of the case. In fact, all eight of these indicators really have that status of being relevant criteria, relevant pieces of evidence, but none by itself being a, a smoking gun, so to speak, that immediately just shows the animals a sentience all by itself. So we looked at possession of nociceptors, possession of integrative brain regions linked to learning and memory. We looked for connections between the nociceptors and the integrative brain regions. 
look for responses being affected by potential local anesthetics or analgesics in ways that make sense with the hypothesis that they're attenuating experiences of pain. We look for behavior showing the animal was balancing uh, risks of injury against opportunity for reward. We looked at flexible self-protective behaviors in response to injury and threat, just to say that the animal responds to injury and threat in a way that seems to involve a representation of where on its body the threat or injury is. We look for associative learning that goes beyond habituation and sensitization, recognizing that there is quite a bit of debate about which types of associative learning are linked to sentience and why. We took all evidence of associative learning as potentially relevant, but some types as more relevant than others. And we look for behavior that shows the animal valuing local anesthetics or analgesics when injured. So some of these criteria could probably exist without any subjective feeling. An animal could possess nociceptors without feeling anything when those nociceptors are triggered. But we contend that you know, all of these pieces are you know, pieces of the puzzle. They're all relevant to questions of sentience because they're all getting at parts of the, overall, of the overall picture when you're asking whether this animal experiences anything uh, when when injured or threatened. Let's move on now to our findings. I mean, we reviewed over 300 scientific studies in, uh, in producing this report over a period of about six months. The report ended up quite a bit longer than we expected it to, you know, essentially because there was quite a bit more evidence than, than we initially thought we would be reviewing. So we read through uh, you know, over 300 scientific papers, quite a lot of work for all the authors involved. The overall balance of evidence, in our view, tilts towards sentience in all of the invertebrate taxa we considered. But that doesn't mean that the evidence is on a par across, you know, right across these two groups. In particular, in, in octopuses, the evidence is very strong indeed. Among decapod crustaceans, the evidence is strongest in the true crabs, the brachyurin crabs. But we also found substantial evidence in, in other coleoid uh, cephalopods, which is squid, octopuses, cuttlefish, and in hermit crabs, anamurin crabs, and astacid lobsters and crayfish. So I'll just show you the table displaying our overall findings. And, you know, no one's going to memorize this table at a at a glance, but if you want to uh, spend a bit more time looking at it, feel free to go to bit.ly slash sentient slides or, or bit.ly slash sentience reports to, uh, to read the whole thing. But what this table gives you at a glance is our confidence levels relating to the eight criteria across all of the uh, orders of cephalopods and uh, infra orders of the decapods. And what you can see at a glance, I think, is that Octopuses were really knocking it out of the park on these criteria, where we have high or very high confidence for uh, almost all of the eight criteria in that case. And then for other groups of animals, the evidence is not as strong as, as for octopuses. But nonetheless, you see a lot of cases where we did have high or very high confidence in crabs. And in fact, right across you know, all of these uh, animals, we ended up, uh, you know, the there's no red essentially on this table because the evidence tilts towards sentience in all of these cases. The case where there's the least evidence um, was Panea shrimps, which was sold commercially as king prawns. Really, it, there would be a case for, for more research in that, in that case to try and, I mean, we know so little about the welfare needs of, of king prawns, it's quite disturbing really. I think um, more research in, the, in that particular area of Panea shrimps would be very valuable, in my opinion. Um, but nonetheless, the overall picture is one on which, while some of these taxa have been studied a lot more than others, octopuses have been studied a lot more than the others, but in cases where they have been studied, it seems like the indicators are very quickly found. I just want to give you some illustrative examples of the types of evidence that were going into the table. As I say, hundreds of studies have gone into the table, but I'll give you three examples of the kind of evidence we took to be relevant. So here is one 
Now, I mentioned that one relevant criterion is, is evidence that an animal values anesthetics or analgesics when, when injured. And there was a study by Robin Crook in 2021 that was exploring this in octopuses, where the octopus has a choice of three chambers. One of them is neutral. The other one, they're placed there after a noxious stimulus, which was acetic acid. Um, in the arm, which is very uh, aversive for octopuses. And then the other chamber they're placed in after um, being injected with a local anesthetic, lidocaine. And if you think about, you know, what, what would you do in that situation? Well, you'd probably develop a lasting aversion to the place you experience the consequences of, the, of, of an injury. And you develop a lasting preference for the place where you where you felt better. You develop a lasting preference for the place where you could access the local anaesthetic when you were injured. And that's exactly what Crook found uh, in octopuses. That you know, just as we, you know, we'd feel pain when injured and we'd develop aversions to places where we felt pain. And just as we'd feel better after anaesthetic and we'd develop a preference for the places where we could that we associated with the anesthetic. The octopuses did exactly that. They, they developed what's called a conditioned place preference for the chamber they were placed after the anesthetic. And moreover, Crook found you know, other consilient lines of evidence suggesting the octopus was feeling pain um, when exposed to acetic acid in that there was directed you know, scraping with the beak at the site of the injury as, as if trying to remove the noxious stimulus. That went away when it was given the anesthetic, so it's no longer trying to scrape away the stimulus from its skin. And Crook also measured the activity in the, the brachial connectives that were parts of the nervous system linking the arms to the brain and showed this big storm of activity when the animal was uh, exposed to the acetic acid that was then silenced by injecting the, the local anesthetic. So very striking study because you've got three conciliant indicators, all clearly compatible with the, what you might call the common sense hypothesis, I suppose, that when this animal is given a noxious stimulus, it feels pain. And then when it's given the lidocaine, it feels better. So first, that was a very high quality and significant study. I want to talk about one that was um, in a decapod, because you might think, um, was the evidence, you know, just the evidence differ a lot in the decapods as opposed to octopuses? There's some very striking evidence from decapods as well. Here's one that, that really, I found really memorable, that's about crayfish in a, in a light maze. So it's a study from Science from 2014 by Fossat et al. And, I mean, for decades, scientists have been putting uh, rats in mazes, seeing what they do. You can also put crayfish in, in mazes, and normally they explore. So there's some light arms and there's some dark arms, and they explore all the arms as, as you might expect them to. Then if you expose them to a stressful stimulus, they used uh, electric shocks in this, uh, this experiment. It suppresses the exploratory behavior. So they no longer explore the light arms. They stick to the dark, the dark arms. That, I suppose, in itself is not very surprising. The really remarkable thing about this study was that when Fossil et al. gave the crayfish an anti-anxiety medication developed for humans, it restored the exploratory behavior. So it restored them, put them back in a state where they're now exploring the light arms as well as the dark. That's remarkable. It's relevant to sentience. Foster says how describe it as showing an anxiety-like state in the crayfish. There's this state that has you know, effects on their overall exploratory behavior. They're much more cautious when exposed to stress, but giving them anti-anxiety medication restores the original behavior. So an anxiety-like state, and it's absolutely remarkable that the very same drugs that would be used to treat that in 
humans have a similar effect in, in the crayfish, despite over 500 million years of evolution separating us. Then there's a third study I wanted to talk about because I, I spoke earlier about the importance of integrating multiple different lines of evidence, including behavioral um, evidence, but also neural evidence. And I wanted to comment a bit on the, the sort of neural evidence we were, we were looking at. Because you could imagine a, a skeptic who says, well, the behavioral evidence is all well and good, but there's no evidence of brain regions that are linked to learning and memory in decapods. And that would have been true until recently, but it's no longer true. There's this wonderful work by Straussfeld and colleagues that is about using antibody staining techniques to identify the regions in the brains of decapods that are linked to learning and memory. So in this figure from a 2020 paper, the pink regions are regions of the, of the brain that are linked to functions related to learning and memory. So when we see these impressively sophisticated things, decapods are doing it's probably these these brain regions that are implicated one striking result is the quite substantial size of these regions in the brachiura so true crabs another striking thing is their very uh, diminished size in the uh, paneid shrimps which is dendrobranchiata in this figure don't know quite what to make of that um it's entirely possible and we discussed this in the report that you know, different brain regions co you know, are co-opted for different functions in different taxa. So it may be that other regions of the brain are, are, being, are involved in learning and memory in the Pinead shrimps, um, and that, that's currently poorly understood. But it, the thing is, you, know, you wouldn't want the whole case for sentience in decapods to rest on this type of evidence, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. It fits all the behavioral evidence and all the cognitive evidence, gives us reason to think, you know, people People have underestimated these animals in the past. They've underestimated what they're capable of behaviorally, but then also estimated how sophisticated and complex their brains are. So it gives you a flavor of the findings, those three studies. We then had this difficult question of, you know, what to recommend on the basis of this complex evidential picture where we've looked at eight criteria and we've assigned confidence levels um, to many different orders and infra orders, there's something like 80 different confidence judgments captured in that table I showed earlier. What to do about that? Well, what we recommended was that in light of this overall evidential picture, with the evidence tilting towards sentience in all of the taxa, we looked at, and in light of the, the you know, various problems associated with trying to exclude particular uh, infra orders on the basis that they haven't really been studied. We recommended that it would be a good idea for all uh, cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans to be regarded as sentient animals for the purposes of UK animal welfare law. They should be regarded as animals for the purposes of the Animal Welfare Act 2006 and included in any future legislation relating to animal sentience. I suppose that the good news is that the, um, the government at least partially implemented our, our central recommendation because they amended their sentience bill that's just going through Parliament now, you know, ju hopefully just about to receive royal assent next week. They amended the bill to say you know, it was originally drafted to include vertebrates and uh, they amended it to say add any cephalopod mollusk and any decapod crustacean. So these animals will be regarded in UK law as, as sentient and they'll fall within the scope of what the sentience bill does which is create a duty on policymakers to pay due regard for animals as sentient beings in future policy making. So I'm happy to to talk more about that uh, later. To me it's a positive step, you know, it's a positive step and it marks the first time in which decapod crustaceans have been explicitly included in the scope of a UK animal welfare law. And to me, that is a good, a good step to be taking. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of skip over that, but su suffice to say, yes, I mean, the, the studies we looked at did not cover all 15,000 species of decapod. And that sometimes leads to the objection that, you know, why are you protecting 15,000 species on the basis of 
evidence from, a, from only a subset of those species. But an important principle for us is that we should be consistent in our treatment of invertebrates and fish. And in fish, you have over 30,000 species, many of which have not specifically been studied. But scientists recognize that one must be willing to generalize in careful, reasonable ways from well-studied lab species to less studied species. Maybe a lot of the evidence is from zebrafish, but that doesn't mean you only protect zebrafish. You're allowed to generalize. Equally, most of the evidence from mammals is from rats. It doesn't mean animal welfare law only protects rats and excludes other mammals. Um, it's sensible to generalize, and we argued it would be sensible to generalize in this case too, and that that's you know, important on grounds of consistency. Now, the sentience bill is a very high level piece of legislation. We recommended that in that context, it's good to, uh, it's good to aim for broad coverage, but also that has to be backed up in some way. And so we recommended that that's backed up with enforceable best practice guidance that's specific to the needs of commercially or scientifically important species. Those bits of our recommendations have so far not been been picked up. You know, the high level recommendation has been implemented, but the you know, we're still sort of waiting really for enforceable best practice guidance relating to commercially important decapods. And I think that would be another huge positive step if that, that happened. The welfare needs do vary greatly from one species to the next, and there's quite you know, significant evidence gaps. Nonetheless, it would be great to see um, some you know, best practice guidance with some with some actual teeth. What we hoped is that the report would start a conversation about you know, we're going to recognise these animals as sentient, as having feelings. How then should we go about treating them humanely? What our report doesn't do is draw up any draft best practice guidance because that's really a huge a huge task that was beyond the scope of our report. But we want to get people talking about this. And if you think about what, what best practice guidance says for vertebrates, well, there's certain very widely endorsed principles. I mean, one important principle, I think, is that welfare regulation is not really a threat to industry. You know, I mean, in the vertebrate case, it's not that It's not that sort of welfare regulations on pigs, sheep, cows, etc., are a threat to industry. In fact, they're a good thing. Um, they protect they protect producers that actually want to maintain high welfare standards, as I think most farmers do. Having regulation protects them from being undercut and having their standards eroded by other uh, people who want to have a race to the bottom and lower their standards. And I think welfare regulations provide reassurance to consumers as well. And I think invertebrates is also a widely accepted principle that um, humane slaughter requires training, that humane slaughter is not just something you can do without any training or relevant knowledge at all. It is, of course, something that requires training. That's you know, the evidence supports that and common sense supports that. And so we'd like to see that principle rolled out to decapods too. There's some steps that we think could be taken right now and that would improve the welfare of decapods. There's one very simple one, which is uh, banning the practice of dechloring, which was previously banned in the UK already between 1986 and 2000. This is the practice where fishermen will um, take a crab out of the water, pull the claw off, throw it back into the water, um, probably condemning it to a uh, a, a slow death because unable, unable to feed. This is already frowned upon in the UK shellfish industry. It's not something that is the norm. And UK fishermen could be very easily banned. I think it'd be a positive step. And then something else that we think could be done in the in the near term is ending this absurd situation where live animals can be sold to completely untrained handlers, even through online retailers like Amazon can go and look on Amazon right now and find you know, live lobster that you can have imported from Canada. You can see the reviews are not very good and that's because the reviews are mostly just saying, what on earth are you doing? I mean, this is not 
this is not our values to do this this is not the sort of st high standards of animal welfare we want to maintain in this country to be sending live animals across the atlantic to completely untrained people to attempt to kill them in whatever way they want it doesn't make any sense and it shouldn't really happen we think there's a need for clear enforceable regulations for the handling storage transport slaughter of decapods and that there's a case for banning the least humane slaughter methods in cases in which a more humane method is clearly available. Now there's a need for a conversation there because sometimes people in the industry will say, well, I've got, uh, if I'm on a fishing vessel, for example, I don't have many options regarding the slaughter methods. I can't have um, large electrical stunning devices and things like that. And you know, conversation on those issues I think is reasonable and should be had. But there are some cases in which you know, large decapods are being slaughtered on land and it would be eminently feasible to stun them beforehand and there's no strong reason not to. We're particularly critical in our report of the practice of just dropping them into boiling water without any prior stunning in cases where a stunning method or faster alternative is available. We, we come down quite you know, harshly on that practice simply because of the evidence. And we reviewed evidence in our report that you, know, you might hope that you drop a crab or a lobster into boiling water and it's instantaneously killed, but that's just not the case. It you know, continues to, to live for two to three minutes, as shown by this study of, by Fragan and Bickmeyer from 2016, where what they're doing is recording the electrical activity in the lobster's nervous system after it's dropped into boiling water. And you can see, you know, just as with, uh, with a human or any other uh, vertebrate, drop it into boiling water, you get a very strong storm of nervous system activity that does not subside for about two minutes. So this is not a quick method and there's no reason at all to think it is the humane method. And we advocate strongly against that. There's other issues where it's, you know, there's a clear need for more research. I think there's a clear need for more research about painkillers that work in cephalopods and decapods. That whole area is very poorly understood. I mentioned lidocaine as an example of a local anesthetic. It does seem to work reasonably well, but we need more research in that area. We need more research into humane stunning and slaughter methods for both cephalopods and decapods. At the moment, we feel as though the evidence in favor of any particular method is, is quite limited. We can say there's evidence against methods that really prolong the animal's death over a period of minutes. Um, but we're a little hesitant to go beyond that. And we think the diverse welfare needs of decapods, especially questions like appropriate temperature ranges and stocking densities for different species, need a huge amount of, of more research. It's been a neglected area. It's really been, we think, unjustly neglected and more research is needed. And we also advocate more research into restraining the claws of, of crabs, particularly brown crabs, where sometimes the tendons are simply cut after the crab is caught. And we find it implausible that that's the only realistic way to immobilize the claws. And we advocate uh, attempts to move beyond that. So it's a complicated picture, as you can see. You know, there's some very clear recommendations in the report, one of which has been implemented, and many of which have not been, but we want to start a conversation about all of those. The sentience bill is definitely a positive step, and we hope it's not, it doesn't then lead to stasis, but rather is the first positive step and leads to subsequent positive steps to actually investigate these issues seriously and try and put some really concrete enforceable measures in place to try and protect the welfare of octopuses, crabs, lobsters, cuttlefish, squid. So thanks very much for your attention. And if you want the slides, bit.ly slash sentient slides. And if you want the full report, it's bit.ly slash sentience report. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was, that was an excellent presentation um, and a massive thank you for all of your work uh, and the other authors work on the report because it certainly felt like a very monumental moment for these animals. So we're now going to, to pass over to Paula Sparks who's going to give us a little bit um, more detail on the legislative framework around fishing crustaceans 
Uh, Paula is a visiting professor at Winchester University, where she teaches an animal law module. And she's also chair of the UK Centre for Animal Law, a charity whose vision is a world where animals are fully protected by law. In her role at A-Law, she oversees the programme of animal law events, publications, advocacy and student outreach and works closely, closely with animal advocacy groups, lawyers and academics. And she also frequently lectures and talks about animal law. Thank you very much and over to you, Paula. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mary, and to the um, brilliant speakers who have gone before me. Um, I'm going to keep my presentation really brief because I just want to give an overview of the law which is necessarily um, in many areas EU derived um, with uh, supplemental legislation that I'll be referring to in the UK. So Tiffany is master of my slides today. So Tiffany, next slide, please. So I'm going to start where Jonathan helpfully, helpfully left off with the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill. And I agree it's a very positive step forward. The amendment to the bill means that animal is now defined wider than vertebrates and includes cephalopod, cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans. I think in an ideal world, we would not have wanted animal to be um, defined any, um, any more restrictively than animal. We, we felt that the word should be given its ordinary meaning rather than um, be limited by the legislation because it, it only the legislation imposes a very uh, broad duty um, on policy makers and so it would be consistent with that but nevertheless what we do have is hugely significant and I know largely reflects the work of Crustacean Compassion and the other NGOs who have uh, fought very hard to ensure that uh, this was uh, raised at policy level and of course would not have been achievable without the scientific underpinning. So it's great. Next slide, please, Tiffany. So just, uh, just looking at the main areas in which we see both fish and uh, crustaceans um, used. So I'm going to start with protection at the time of slaughter. If we move on. And at EU level, the relevant regulation is this one here, 1099-2009. And this provides the uh, legislative framework for the European Union. Next slide, please, Tiffany. And animal, for the purpose of this regulation, is defined as any vertebrate animal, but actually reptiles and amphibians are specifically excluded. And that wasn't because um, the EU didn't recognise that they are sentient, but because reptiles and amphibians were said to be not commonly farmed within the community. And so it wasn't felt to be appropriate to include them within the detailed recommendations in the regulation. Next one. Invertebrates are not included in the regulation, which means that there is no protection of invertebrates at all at the time of slaughter. So the detailed regulations that um, are set out in the 2009 reg do not uh, protect invertebrate species at all. Next one, Tiffany, thank you. Fish, on the other hand, um, are the subject of the regulation. They're vertebrates. So this means in effect that the general duty applies to them, that is that they should be spared avoidable pain, distress or suffering during their killing and related operations. However, the detailed provisions set out under the regulation, which you can see extremely detailed regulations in relation to uh, land vertebrates, do not apply to fish. So they don't have the benefit of the detailed um, protection that other species have. Next slide, please, Tiffany. Um, and why is this? Um, the regulation itself sets out in the preamble that at the time, uh, the EU felt there was a need for further scientific evidence and economic evaluations. So it's not just the science missing, but the economic impact on industry. And essentially it's put over, it said well, there should be separate standards established 
on the protection of fish at the time of killing, and that's going to come later. We'll, we'll see what's happened next. Next slide. Um, the 2009 regulation is given effect in the UK through these series of regulations, which are known um, as WATOC, so welfare of animals at the time of killing, and each of the devolved regions has its own regulation, more or less, but not identical, um, identically the same. Next slide. Thank you. Now, in the in the UK regulation, fish are protected because they come under the EU regulation. So they're protected to the extent that um, they are spared, the sure should be spared avoidable pain, distress and suffering, whatever that means in practice. And I know that Amra will come on and talk about that. But interestingly, reptiles, fish and invertebrates are also extended that level of protection from avoidable pain, distress and suffering. And this is a hangover from before the 2009 regulation that was actually retained in UK law. So um, that's more extensive than provided by the EU regulation. Next slide, please. Um, so we remember, if we remember um, the uh, rationale for not including the detailed protections for fish, well, that we needed more work. Well, there has been more work. The Farm Animal Welfare Council in Britain published um, a, an opinion in 2014 setting out recommendations for detailed protection. And in 2018, the European Commission also published a report. However, the, that hasn't resulted in any new legislation being proposed. And instead, uh, uh, thinking seems to be that they will rely on uh, existing codes of practice. When we come to farming and husbandry, next slide please. Uh, the General Farm Animals Directive applies. This sets out a very general duty of care for animals who are kept for um, farming purposes and this uh, directive, this EU directive includes all vertebrates, including fish, reptiles and amphibian, amphibians, but specifically excludes invertebrates. So Article 1 excludes those. Next slide, please. Um, the 98 directive has been transposed into national law in the United Kingdom through these regulations, the Welfare of Farmed Animal Regulations which again are different but similar in the devolved regions. Next slide, please. And um, these actually specifically exclude fish, reptiles and amphibians. Um, so although the, um, the directive makes provision for them, there is no provision within um, UK law, within the UK regulations for um, fish, reptiles and amphibians in terms of husbandry. Next slide, please. So what does exist for fish? There is a range of advice and guidance available at policy level. We have the Council of Europe recommendations on the welfare of farmed fish. There's the World Organization for Animal Health Principles. Of course, the 2014 and the 2017 EU and FORC studies, but these are all um, advisory only um, and don't amount to hard law. Next slide, please. When it comes to transportation, we have a quick look at that next. The, the Council Directive 2000, uh, number one of 2005 makes it an offence for animals to be transported in a way that's likely to cause injury or undue suffering. This applies only to vertebrate animals, so we know that captures fish but not invertebrates. Next slide please. And when we look at how that's been transposed into UK law, um, interestingly, the, um, in England, the Welfare of Animals Transport Order extends that protection to cold-blooded invertebrate animals. So there is a protection of sorts for um, invertebrate animals 
um, in terms of their transportation. Now, this is only in the um, regs in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and not in Scotland, where obviously there is more commercial activity around um, the farming of invertebrates. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is this is the extent of the protection. It's an offence to transport any animal in a way which causes or is likely to cause injury or unnecessary suffering. And there are provisions that about they should be kept, obviously, in a way that is um, commensurate to their needs. And it specifically applies to the transport of cold blooded invertebrate animals. Um, what that means in practice um, is very difficult to discern. I haven't seen any prosecutions. Um, I'm not, not aware of this being enforced, but it sits on the statute books. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we look at national animal welfare laws in the United Kingdom, we have animal welfare acts. Again, it's the Animal Welfare Act of 2016 that applies in England and Wales with equivalent provisions in Scotland and Northern Ireland. And this provides a general welfare duty protecting vertebrate animals. Um, so if we have a vertebrate animal um, under the control of a person, there is a welfare duty to protect that animal. And there is also a prohibition on causing unnecessary pain or distress to protected vertebrate animals. That does not extend to invertebrates. Next slide, please. There is actually a power in the legislation itself to extend the definition of animal beyond a vertebrate to any uh, type of invertebrate. If the national authority, so that would be the minister, is satisfied on the basis of scientific evidence that animals of the kind concerned are capable of experiencing pain or suffering. Now, the point to bear in mind here is this is a power, it's not a duty. So the fact that uh, the minister may be satisfied that the scientific evidence points towards uh, a creature being capable of experiencing pain and suffering isn't necessarily enough for the um, to trigger a change, the discretion lies with the national authority as to whether it chooses to implement that. And I think one of the other problems with this clause or this section is that although that power exists, there is no corresponding duty upon the minister to review the scientific evidence um, over a period of time. And so the report that was uh, commissioned from the London School of Economics was extremely welcome. If we think the Animal Welfare Act came into force in 2006, it's been a very long time coming. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how far does the Animal Welfare Act protect fish? We know fish are vertebrates, we know at the time, but the Animal Welfare Act was enacted uh, that uh, it was would have been known that fish uh, experienced a degree of pain and suffering, but the legislation itself ex specifically excludes fishing as a in terms of our recreational activity. So that is specifically excluded, and it remains the case that whilst the Animal Welfare Act provides a degree of protection to fish who are farmed because they are under the control of people and so there is a duty to meet their welfare needs. There is no detailed legislation, there are no statutory codes of practice and all we really have are these voluntary codes and welfare standards through for example the RSPCA Freedom Food Assurance Scheme that, that in the absence of specific guidelines um, that would, is arguably a very weak form of legal protection. Next slide, please. And, um, sorry, Tiffany, next slide. Um, as Jonathan's already mentioned, in terms of uh, animal research, um, it has been recognised since 2010 that cephalopods should be uh, the subject of some protection. In fact, um, 
it was uh, a degree earlier that the UK recognised that octopus should also be protected for these purposes. And of course, fish are protected because they are vertebrate species. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so uh, this, this uh, just gives the history that octopus were protected under ASPA, that's the Animal Scientific Procedures Act, um, since an amendment in 1993 to that act. Um, and uh, EU level, that was widened to um, include living cephalopods. So that's a much more expanded um, definition of animals now. And that's it. So that was a very quick canter through. All of the all of, all that this presentation does is tell you what's on the tin, and I think it's much more interesting to hear from Amro and Claire about what's happening on the ground and what this actually means in practice in terms of the protection of uh, fish and crustaceans and decapods. So I'll hand straight over to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, this was a very informative uh, presentation, I think. Um, it seems that the law is lacking in protection of um, fish and crustaceans. So uh, we will hand over to um, speakers who maybe will say a little bit more, more about um, legislative asks um, in this area. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, um, Amr Hussein. Um, he is a political activist with expertise in encouraging national governments to protect um, human rights. Uh, as director of the UK All-Party Parliamentary Group for International Freedom of Religion or Belief, Amro advised and um, supported parliamentarians to champion the rights of persecuted religious and belief minorities. Uh, Amro now uses his experience of successful parliamentary engagement um, to support the animal protection movement in his role as Senior Public Affairs um, Lead at the Humane League uh, UK. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Nadia. Um, let me try and do the old technical bit now and see if I can get the this uh, screen up. Um, can we see that? Hold on. Perfect. Is that up now for everyone? Great. So thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, I mean, it's a privilege to speak, but also it's just a really good opportunity for me to listen to all these fantastic presentations. I feel like I'm learning so much that um, just from my own personal curiosity, but also I think it's uh, really useful kind of for, for our organization to think about kind of areas and policy asks and, and things that we might want to pursue going forward. So I'm going to speak a bit about the uh, Humane League UK um, and our campaign as it relates to fishes. So as a charity, we exist to end the abuse of animals raised for food. Um, typically, our work kind of focuses on corporate campaigning. We look at interventions that are effective in reducing the most suffering for animals who are farmed in the greatest numbers. So we've done a lot of work um, with chickens specifically and a lot of cage-free work, kind of trying to push global brands to go cage-free worldwide and been quite successful in that. Uh, for example, last year, Young Brands, um, which is responsible for KFC and Pizza Hut and many others, went uh, introduced a global cage-free policy. So that's kind of been our approach, kind of pushing corporate corporations to, to change their policies. Our focus, though, on trying to help animals who are farmed in the largest numbers inevitably led us to move towards work for farmed fishes and particularly um, into political legislative work. Obviously, as we've heard throughout the presentations earlier, uh, fishes are more than capable of experiencing pain and pleasure. They've been hugely neglected and raised for food in enormous numbers, which dwarf the numbers of terrestrial farms. So this led us to our campaign, which is the Forgotten Fish Campaign. Now that name indicates the neglected nature of fish welfare in law and enforcement, but also, to be honest, among um, animal organizations, including the Humane League. Um, I think there's a lot of work for animal organizations to do to, to start really championing um, fishes in, in terms of welfare. Um, and for this campaign, we explored lots of different fish welfare issues, but we decided to focus on fish welfare slaughter. And essentially, our goal is to get detailed stunning requirements outlined in law for farmed fish. And it was very useful to, to go after Paula's very excellent presentation where she spoke a bit about some of these uh, regulations and spoke about how uh, the main piece of kind of slaughter legislation in the UK is the welfare of animals at the time of killing regulations or WATOC. Um, 
Now, as we heard, that requires that all animals are to be spared any avoidable pain, distress, or suffering during their killing and related operations. But as Paula highlighted, there is a discrepancy here. Watok outlines detailed requirements in law for how terrestrial farm animals are to be handled, how they're to be transported, stunned and slaughtered to ensure that they meet that objective of being spared the unnecessary suffering. But Watok doesn't contain any specific legal guidance on, on how to un avoid unnecessary pain for fish or what constitutes avoidable suffering and slaughter. This lack of clarity essentially leaves millions of fish at risk at a painful death from incorrect stunning, handling, transport, etc. So our legisl legislative ask is kind of a simple one. We're trying to get uh, clear, detailed legal provisions um, for the welfare of farmed fish. Now, there are lots of uh, problems in fish farming, unfortunately. Um, it's very far removed from some of the maybe more idyllic fishing images that a lot of the public have in their mind. Uh, some of these issues, um, for example, confinement and high stocking density. This creates crowding, barren environments, it restricts fish's natural behavior and social structure and causes them lots of stress. But there's also other issues that come from this confinement, like the spread of sea lice, which damages skin and flesh of fish, sometimes severely. And the conditions in many fish farms help sea lice to thrive. And we also find that health defects um, are prevalent in fish farms. And are, you know, there's many types of cataracts, spinal deformities, deafness, and and many more. So the question then becomes, why, why this particular ask? Why focusing um, on slaughter? And it's a product, I think, of two points. One is a focus on sig significant suffering reduction, but also combined with a calculation on potential for, for success. So in terms of suffering reduction, obviously at time of slaughter is a short time in the life of a fish, but slaughter at stunning is extremely stressful and painful. Um, and when combined with this calculation about potential for success, we arrived at this because we know that fish um, for, you know, to, to be campaigning on fish welfare issues to be difficult. There really hasn't been an enormous amount of campaigning work done before, either with public or parliamentarians. So we had to be pragmatic, essentially, and try and think about targets that are relatively achievable. And why did we think the getting these stunning requirements, focusing on fish welfare at slaughter was something that we believed um, is, 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 is potentially achievable? Um, the first point is that there is already existing support for the recommendations that we're asking for. The British Veterinary Association have called for it. And as Paula mentioned, in 2014, the Animal Welfare Committee did an assessment of uh, welfare of fish at the time of killing and made a recommendation to the government to incorporate um, their recommendations into legislation. Interestingly as well, the governments uh, in the UK, both Scottish and English, were supportive of these recommendations in the past and considered bringing them to the EU while we were still in the EU in 2014, but it wasn't taken up there. So what we know is that there is support between animal organisations and experts, and also that the government in 2014 was supportive of it. Another key point is that the industry is already mostly doing it. We don't have exact figures because no one's necessarily monitoring how many um, fish producers are stunning accurately, but we believe that it is a significant majority are implementing some form of either percussive or electrical stunning. So from that basis, um, it shouldn't be, having a legislative change shouldn't be something that would um, encourage huge amounts of industrial opposition. And as kind of Jonathan made the, the very good point about this, having a, a, a floor, having legislation that protects higher welfare producers from being potentially undercut by lower welfare producers. Now, all this doesn't mean um, that achieving this particular ask is easy or that the other issues aren't vitally important, but this was seen as a key issue which can hopefully be built upon. And there's also the point that in Norway, there is this legislative requirement for stunning for fishes. And um, so there is an example there that we could point to, particularly when we're kind of engaging with parliamentarians to show them that this, this welfare provision is, is a feasible one and is pragmatic and realistic. So we decided to focus on fish welfare at slaughter, particularly looking at stunning requirements. 
Uh, but before we began our campaign, we decided to do a little bit of research and um, to engage with uh, focus groups, to do YouGov polls, and to um, essentially try and get a, a rough kind of baseline of where some of the public were and some parliamentarians were in terms of their attitudes towards fish welfare. And I think what was kind of the main, most striking of, of the evidence that we found from kind of a YouGov poll of a few thousand people um, was that most did believe that fish feel pain. Uh, we weren't really sure about that when we started with how, how prevalent that would be, but on some level, most people did, or at the very least, they didn't. Um, they didn't disagree with the idea. Very few people said, no, I don't think that uh, fish feel pain at all. Um, so that raises kind of interesting questions about uh, why people care or don't care necessarily about fish, how they're to be emotionally engaged. And we tried showing them kind of different advertisements and focus groups and things, different, different approaches to see what engaged them. For example, showing footage of essentially fishes being clubbed while still conscious due to incorrect information of stunning was quite evocative for people. They found that very difficult to, 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 to handle and, and rightly so, it's a very uh, uh, difficult thing to see. However, in that same research, we found um, that emphasizing asphyxiation, emphasizing that uh, you know, fish could suffocate when being removed from water, didn't really create much of um, a connection with people at all. Perhaps they've been desensitized to the image or didn't connect to it in that way. So we're still really kind of working out what, pe what people think and what people care about in terms of uh, fish welfare. But we did find that, the, I mean, the key findings were that people do believe that fishes feel pain and that also people do believe that they should have the same legal protections as other farmed animals. And it was clear that that comparison was quite effective for people. Uh, saying that should fishes have legal protections at slaughter wasn't as powerful for people as saying that, well, terrestrial farm animals have this protection, should fishes have the same? And that we found that was very, uh, that was quite powerful. And again, raises interesting questions. It kind of implies almost that there is more of an intellectual reasoning that people are arriving at there, that they could see the logic of that rather than making an emotional connection about fishes deserving uh, protection. So those are some of our key findings, but we also found um, that there are some challenges um, when we discussed, spoke to people of focus groups and kind of things that you, you might reasonably suspect. Uh, the first one is that people just don't know that fish farming is a thing. And um, we found that a lot of people hadn't really heard about that. The images is that you have people in mind is just, you know, a lone fisherman out there, you know, with a, with a rod. And, and that's how people think we get fish, but that's uh, obviously incorrect. Um, and then within people who are aware about fish farming, people are generally unaware about the fish welfare issues, some of the, the points that I mentioned earlier. And then we found, as again, you might reasonably expect that people find it just a little bit harder to connect with fishes than land animals as it stands at the moment and particularly don't tend to see them as individuals and we see that you know within consumers but in general in industry and beyond where the discourse about about fish is in tons rather than about the numbers of individual fishes killed you know we would never talk about tons of dogs or tons of sheep but we do talk about tons of, of, of fish rather than thinking about them as individualized animals so those are some of the challenges and some of the other things that we found in kind of research. Um, and that we gathered this and then proceeded to, to start campaigning. And kind of the first point in, in our campaign, the first thing you really need to do is begin with education and storytelling. Um, and we need to help people understand that there is a problem. So that kind of first thing on your screen there is just a still from um, a video that we produced entitled Five Things the Government Doesn't Want You Know About Fish Farming, kind of highlighting people uh, to people the, the problems, included footage from an animal equality investigation showing some kind of gra showing graphic violence of, of fish being killed without, without stunning. So for our specific campaign ask, we're kind of focusing on this, showing people this part of, of, of the life of fish and, and the issue there. But I think there is a much broader thing to be done uh, regarding education and storytelling about fishes with the public um, beyond this campaign. Um, it's fascinating to hear, um, you know, Colum's presentation and 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 just and, and about the wealth of evidence that that we have. But to think about why that hasn't necessarily uh, been translated to 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 people yet, and to think about what we can do to facilitate that. And so, you know, for example, this uh, picture of a book that I have on the right. Is, is a really excellent book called What a Fish Knows, which highlights a lot of kind of some of the interesting points and facts that, that Colin was talking about earlier. 
And we're thinking about ways how we can try and communicate this information and communicate this story in a way that will, will engage people a bit more. So the next stage was really about political engagement. And that's kind of been a lot of the bulk of, of the work that we've been doing on this campaign specifically on trying to change this, um, to change WATOC. So we're trying to engage members of parliament and um, members of Scottish parliament as well to, to, to act on this issue. And similarly here, we have to do kind of education and to talk about the issue. And similarly, we don't find uh, so much that parliamentarians are, at least the ones we've engaged with thus far, are very skeptical of, of the, the issue of fishes feeling pain. It's just more about whether there is kind of political will about this, whether there is public interest in this to, to, to really motivate them. Um, so we've been trying to engage them to act on this issue. For example, I recently spoke to the Scottish Cross Party Group on Animal Welfare and delivered a presentation about our campaign to try and encourage them to take action. Um, and we've been engaging with the Scottish and, and English governments, writing letters to them, but also trying to get our supporters to engage the government. And the other part of this slide is we had our supporters draw lovely posters of them and fishes and send them in postcards to the Scottish government. Um, and that actually got a really good response from the Scottish government and started opening up the lines of communication with us a bit more. But another really important uh, factor in trying to influence the government and do political engagement is responding to, to consultations. So the Animal Welfare Committee is updating its opinion on the welfare of, of farm fish at the time of killing. Um, so we submitted to that in writing to some of the evidence that, um, that, that, that is out there now, but also tried to present in person to really try to push the government from not only from a public perspective, but also kind of from a scientific perspective and provide them the evidence that people like Colin, people like Jonathan and others have, have done on, on this issue. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of our campaigning work here is also really about the importance of kind of coordination. I think uh, lots of animal organizations and not just Humane League um, UK have been thinking a lot more recently about how I think collectively maybe fish welfare has been neglected and how important it is and what we can do in this area. So one thing that we've been doing in our organization is trying to organize monthly calls with animal organizations working in the area to coordinate our efforts, to try and avoid duplication of effort, and essentially to amplify our voice to the government and doing joint letters and campaigns and actions like that. So you might be wondering from all this, then what was the government's been response been to, to the campaign thus far? Now, it's quite interesting because as I said before, um, the government in 2014 was uh, both both the English and Scottish um, essentially accepted the Animal Welfare Committee's opinion and brought it to the EU. Um, but it wasn't taking up there, and then it was basically essentially abandoned. And now, when we um, when we discuss this. Essentially, the point is that there are voluntary codes of good practice and industry standards to guide, which are sufficient. They're not sufficient. <laughs> um, industry standards are clearly inconsistent and do not offer all fish the same protection. You know, we've been pointed to, for example, the Scottish Code of Good Practice for, for aquaculture, but this Code of Good Practice doesn't, uh, doesn't even mention stunning or slaughter requirements necessarily. Now, the RSPCA assured standard and certification scheme is much better and does include these things, but for example, the RS that scheme doesn't have um, they don't do unannounced inspections of fish processing sites. So again, is limited in its ability to enforce. And then that's really the problem, essentially. And I think Paul alluded to it there, that well, we just don't, we have limited enforcement mechanisms until we have uh, legislation in place. Kind of under current conditions, you know, a, a producer can reasonably say that they're meeting their legal requirement to avoid unnecessary suffering. Once they have some form of stunning in place, even if they're doing it completely incorrectly in a way which causes pain, you know, and, and, and this does happen and we've seen it happen. We've seen investigations which have revealed extreme suffering caused by the incorrect inflammation of stunning. I mentioned animal equality and they did an investigation on the Scottish Salmon Company, a you know, major producer, and found that despite the stunning device being in place in this facility, numerous salmon displayed consciousness at the time of slaughter. Many salmon skills were cut when they were still conscious, causing them to be in agony for up to several minutes as a result. And this is the problem you have that nothing can be done essentially about this from, from, from a legal perspective. And this also created, you know, this lack of clear enforceable legal requirements. It's all a facilitate an environment where essentially there's been limited to no government oversight of fish welfare slaughter. You know, the government doesn't know how many fishes are or not being stunned because they don't have to collect that info by law. 
you know, one part of our campaigning and a part of our search at the start was we just wanted to get a lay of the land about who has responsibility over this, who is who is actually doing this. So we sent freedom of information requests to Food Standards Scotland, we sent them to Marine Scotland, we sent them to the Animal Plant and Health Agency, all asking about like what their process is in terms of uh, inspections and investigations. And what we found is that there are no routine inspections of fish welfare uh, slaughter processing sites. And, and beyond that, we found that they didn't really know who was who was supposed to be responsible for it. You know, we received some letters where they were kind of just passing the book to different agencies. Um, so there's a clear, clear lack of oversight there. And that got picked up in, in The Guardian and then some other locations. And what we have is now that the first ever kind of, I think, routine inspections, from what I understand, only just started in February now. And that was in response to the animal quality investigation and some of this bad press. But without that bad press, without that kind of, uh, you know, public oversight, to, if you want to describe it that way, this wouldn't have happened. And basically, people, producers would be allowed to continue doing whatever they like. And I think the final point about the voluntary codes being insufficient is essentially that the welfare of animals at slaughter is just far too important to essentially allow the industry to police itself. Um, and beyond that, having no law for fishes inherently implies that they are less deserving of protections than other animals. So even from a uh, you know, more kind of qualitative or uh, point of view, it's really important to have um, this type of legislation. There's essentially just no reason for, for this disparity and no reason that land farm animals would need legal protection slaughter, but fish wouldn't, as we discussed, they are sentient and that's acknowledged even by the law. Uh, so we need, like with terrestrial farm animals, um, legislation to ensure consistency, ensure correct implementation and, ensure, uh, of, of implementation and enforcement of stunning. So what are the next steps? So the Animal Welfare Committee, which was the Farm Animal Welfare Committee, as I mentioned, they've kind of been asked, they've been asked to update their opinion on the welfare of farm fish at slaughter. Uh, we're expecting this in the summer um, and hope being hopeful with the more, you know, as there's much more evidence than there was even when they made this opinion in 2014, that it'll be the third time the government is told the fish need equivalent protections. So from our perspective, it's just important to make as much noise as possible about this. So the government acts. Um, the government, from our perspective, is unlikely to be rigidly opposed to this change in principle, but we find is that they don't necessarily want to regulate agriculture and also think that people just don't care. So I'll end by just saying some things that the public can do kind of to support this, this campaign. Um, and the typical thing, obviously, is write to your MSP um, or write to your, to your MP. And I think, I think that sometimes sounds a bit flippant, but, but I think it has a lot more effect than people think it does if you can open the conversation with your parliamentarian. From having worked in, in Westminster myself in, in the House of Commons, I can see that when uh, a few conservative citizens regularly open up channels of communications with their MP, it's actually quite effective because they take it to represent um, a, a subset of, of how many other people care about it in the constituency. So I think it can be quite powerful. But I also recommend if you want to know more about this or keep involved with the campaign or how you can get involved to sign up, um, go to the Humane League uh, UK website, sign up to our newsletter, um, and we have plenty of kind of actions that you can do uh, to support the campaign there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amro. That was a, a brilliant presentation. It's lovely to hear about all of the work that you and, and the Humane League are doing, and thank you. Also fascinating to learn about the, the different public reception to different campaigns and, and images and videos as well. We'll definitely share um, some of the actions, the public actions on our, our social media as well, um, things that people can be doing. So next, uh, we're delighted to be hearing from Claire Howard, from Crustacea Compassion. Uh, Claire is Executive Director of Crustacea Compassion and has been campaigning for the legal protection and humane treatment of decapod crustaceans since Crustacea Compassion was founded in 2016. A recipient of the RSPCA Honours Campaign Award, Claire is a passionate advocate of evidence-based campaigning. She has worked internationally on a diverse array of animal welfare issues during her 15 years in the third sector. Thank you very much, Claire, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I will keep this very brief because I'm just very aware of the timing um, with this and, and just how detailed um, the previous speakers have been. So thank you um, to the previous panellists because you've been, it's been an informative evening as anticipated. Thank you. Um, right, I will keep this as an incredibly brief overview. I will try and do the technical thing and just 
briefly share my screen if I can do. Okay. Let me know is that showing for you all? Yeah, excellent. Right. So let's get through this. Um, okay, so just a brief introduction. Um, Crustacean Compassion was founded in 2016. Um, we are an animal welfare organization that is dedicated to the protection and humane treatment of decapod crustaceans. So we were originally founded because there was a lack of protection for these animals. We discovered that they could be sold in supermarkets in London, shrink wrapped um, while still alive and conscious. And there was nothing that any of the enforcement agencies could do about it because they didn't come under any, they didn't receive any adequate protections. Um, once we looked into it a little bit more, we discovered that actually this was despite the fact that there was evidence of sentience for them um, and that the, the evidence wasn't essentially being acted on and that it seemed legally and morally and scientifically inconsistent when looking at the protections that other animals that are eaten for food received. I'm going to whistle stop through these um, concerns because a lot of them were covered earlier in, in Jonathan's talk. Um, so we looked at what the main issues that we thought were with um, decapod crustaceans. So predominantly the food industry comes to mind, but they are also covered um, within other um, sectors, for example, laboratory experimentation, um, which is also a significant area of concern. But the areas that we looked at and that are kind of most naturally kind of grouped together is capture, transport, storage, holding, um, mutilations they experience, and of course, slaughter. So some of the welfare issues that they experience during um, capture, it's largely dependent on how they're actually captured. So this, this does vary by species and also by geographical location um, and just kind of local um, kind of quirks. Um, so they are all of these different issues. You can find a lot more information about. I will give you a slight plug there, Jonathan. Um, in your paper, there's a in the report from LSE, there is a lot more detail about the different methods and some of the different issues with this. So it's a really great, great place to go and find some more data on this. Um, some of the issues, I mean, the, the issues in, in transport are quite extensive because the different types of methods that are used during transportation, the length of transport um, and, and what kind of they face, whether it's international import and export or whether it's within cross, across country. Um, and as again, Jonathan mentioned with home delivery, um, the significant issue with they're just being sent effectively in the post um, by people who aren't trained to handle them and without the adequate protections that they would require. Um, to preserve their well-being, let alone their stress levels. Um, you can also see some further detail um, on here about some of the issues that they do find, like overcrowding, confinement, the manual handling experience, the road vibrations, um, air, sunlight. There's an awful lot of different ways that these animals can experience stress. They are, whilst they look quite hardy um, with their kind of exoskeletons, they, they actually are quite vulnerable, um, particularly um, some species more than others, but it is something where they do find the whole experience quite stressful and they, it can really affect their mortality rates. Um, how they are stored as well, it can be a significant issue um, within the industry. This is this covers the whole range of the kind of seated plate journey that they experience. Um, also, this, they're stored whilst they're on the boat, they're then stored whilst they're in port, um, they're stored in restaurants, depending at which part they're actually um, slaughtered at as well. So again, the needs and the requirements of these animals um, are frequently not met um, whilst they're being stored. So this can be things like water quality, temperature, stocking densities, um, and the impacts it can have can be, can be quite severe depending on the species and the length of time um, and the severity of, of the experience of the um, environment that they're kept in. Um, they, also, they are also unfortunately um, exposed to various different mutilations, which are can be again quite um, a, quite shocking and when you compare to if they were to be done in other species and other animals, um, things like eye stalk ablations, the removal of the eye stalks um, in prawns, um, the dechlorine of crabs, again the manual removal of crabs we found to be much more stressful and to have a negative effect on animals when compared to if they jettison their own claws, um, which is an, a kind of a, something they can do naturally if they're stressed, but it's it has a very different impact on them than if it's something that's done manually by, by a person. Um, nicking of claws, again if you cutting the tendon of an animal, um, you can imagine how, again, with other animals, how they would experience that. It's not being much different for um, the decapods. So all of these different mutilations and some others that they experience as well, they're unacceptable in the same way they would be for other animals. And so Procession Compassion has been campaigning um, to get this stopped and to, to have them prohibited. Some of them were already prohibited, as Jonathan said, the dechlorine of crabs was banned at one point, and then it now it isn't again. So, and, and they're done to a greater or lesser extent, again, depending on which species they are, whereabouts you're looking, um, 
Some of these aren't particularly widespread, which means they should in theory be quite an easy win and quite an easy thing to implement. Um, so, but some of them would need a little bit more consideration and, and will need a lot more engagement with industry um, to find alternatives. And we come into the one that a lot of people know about, and we certainly get a lot of questions about, um, especially boiling alive. It's the phrase and the thought that seems to resonate very easily with members of the public and with people who don't know the specifics. I mean, we've been very fortunate tonight to hear from some very, um, very kind of educated and experienced people who, who know these, who know the science behind all of this. And it is complex. It is something that, that people do spend a lot of time studying to try and to try and really get a, an, an understanding of. However, anybody, anybody that you speak to on the streets, anybody who knows nothing about animals or nothing about animal welfare or sentience can understand the concept of, of pain if being bored alive. So it does make it quite a levelling um, experience in terms of for us as campaigners. It's quite a useful element to focus on because it's something that people can instantly relate to regardless of the species. And um, there are also other issues that they face when they're being um, when they're being slaughtered, whether that's through um, the use of ice slurries or freshwater drowning, um, they're a little bit harder to communicate to people sometimes because the, the reasons why, they're, um, why they can be cruel is quite hard sometimes to, to get across, but it's something that is just as, um, just as unfortunate and just as unacceptable for these animals as boiling is. Um, also, unfortunately, people do try to do things that are kinder for animals um, or that they perceive to be kinder, for example, putting, um, putting decapods in the freezer um, prior to boiling them. That's uh, one of the myths that we hear a lot of where people are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do a kindness to an animal, but actually that's, that can have the opposite effect. Um, it can actually take them longer to then boil uh, when they do then get put in boiling water because it takes longer for their core temperature to raise back to what it would need to be. So unfortunately, when people are trying to do kind things, it doesn't work out that way. And it just reinforces why it's so critically important that, that the slaughter of an animal isn't undertaken by somebody who isn't trained um, doesn't know kind of what they're doing and doesn't have the right expertise or skills or equipment with them to make sure that it's done humanely. So there are humane alternatives available. Um, as has been alluded earlier um, in, this, in this talk, it's been there is more study needed for certain aspects of things and for the specifics of things. There is more, more kind of research needed to, to help find finesse elements, but there is already options that are more humane than what's currently being done that we do know. We know what is cruel and what should be stopped, and we know that there are ways that to make to improve that. Um, industry is already undertaking some of this, so people, you know, there is industry support like Tesco's, Waitrose, m and they're already doing humane stunning um, and pre pre prior to slaughter. Um, it can be done, it just does need, it needs the industry engagement further and industry to really take this on board and to really start owning this area. Up until um, Jonathan's report was, was um, released, and of course, your Jonathan LSC report um, was published, there has it's always been used as the thing that could be pinged back and forth. Oh, well, it's we're not knowing if they're sentient. Nobody's quite sure if they're sentient. There's evidence before, there's evidence against. So it's, it's it's one of those things we don't quite know. And that was the thing that was always stated to us that that the sentience is unsure. It's not we're not positive about it. And as Jonathan again said, we can't. It's not about being positive about something. It's saying now that these animals are likely to be sentient there is strong evidence of their sentience therefore that is now and um, it's not a question of why or whether it's a question of that they are so that makes it much more straightforward for us and i think it makes it straightforward for industry as well because it does take that very important question off the table for them it's a case of these animals are sentient what are we going to do about it and we're very help very kind of happy to work with them on that and to look for where these options can be implemented can be implemented wherever feasible there can be simple adaptations as well. It doesn't have to be really complex things. It can be small changes that can be done potentially, but just ensuring that these animals have enough space and appropriate environments. Um, it, we can start small and work the way up, but it is a case where there are some really significant things that could be done. Um, and again, it's something where industry is now starting to look at this themselves and there are kind of work starting to be done on codes of practice. Um, from our perspective, it's now going to be making sure that they that they're from a perspective that works welfare as well as just from an economic perspective. It does have to be balanced of the two. So for the work we've been doing, the story so far, um, for us, the first part, I mean, so we've been working on this since 2016. Um, our first port of call was creating a case for change. So for that, we have, we had, we started off the petition. That was originally how this all started. We were just going to do a petition for six months. Um, a group of us thought it was something that needed to be worked on, so we thought we'll just do a petition, hand it over to a larger organisation, 
And six years later, uh, it's kind of morphed from being one six month petition into a fully kind of fledged organization that's um, that's not showing any signs of slowing down really. Um, so we showed, we demonstrated that it was, it was an issue of public concern. Um, we also spoke to many different experts on this across the a broad spectrum of expertise. Um, and we had that they signed our open letter that called for legal protection. So we were able to demonstrate that it wasn't just the public wanted this, but that there was enough evidence and there were enough expertise and people from across the board that thought this should also happen. We spoke to animal welfare organisations. Um, over 40 of them also signed on and said, that yes, they believe decapods should be protected in legislation. It also bears and worth, is worth bearing in mind that in the UK alone each year, 420 million decapods are landed by UK vessels into UK ports. Um, that's just that is literally just what that is. It's UK vessels into UK ports. That is fishing vessels that are coming in. So that will be an underrepresented number. Um, as was mentioned again, we have a, a battle in terms of identifying these animals as being individuals. These are these are individual animals. They are only counted by tons. They only count so the number of them we've had to kind of extrapolate out as to what's likely to be the number. So again, we've been incredibly conservative on our figures with this. So it is likely to be much higher. If we looked and included the number of animals that are imported, the number of decapods that are imported for the food industry, we would be into the billions, um, well over five billion at least. And that's just into the UK annually. So this is a this is a huge issue that would impact a huge number of animals. So it's really been really important to us that we get this right. So what happens next? Well, we heard earlier about the sentience bill and about the, the wonderful steps that have been taken um, in terms in translating the evidence of their sentience into a legal recognition of their sentience. However, that will only take us so far. It's great for me that there will be their sentience will need to be recognised and taken into consideration for future policy decisions. But what about the average crab on the street, so to speak? What would happen for them the day after um, the sentience bill gets royal assent? what actually changes for these animals? Can you stop boiling a lobster alive? No, you can't is essentially the answer, um, is that you can, nothing much changes for them at all. The next stage is gonna be really important, which is putting the words into action. So looking at existing legislation, looking at how we can translate the application and the understanding and the acceptance that they are sentient animals, and means, as Paula outlined, that they should be included within the Animal Welfare Act, um, for England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland that they should be part of the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act. At the moment, there's no records kept. Nobody has to know how many of these animals are used, in what ways they're used, how, who's using them. Um, they're quite under, under, underestimated in terms of their ability to feel pain, meaning that they can be used by anybody. They can be used for undergraduate studies um, in a way that other animals simply wouldn't be allowed to. So actually just getting a hang of hang what that means and what implication that's going to have is actually quite a big piece of work in itself. So that's something we're going to be working very, very closely um, with other organisations who have been working in this area for a long time as well. So it's very much about sharing expertise, sharing knowledge and working together to achieve that, all of these different points. Um, again, Paula alluded earlier to the welfare at the time of killing regulations and, and the welfare of animals and transport orders, that there is complexities around that that we're kind of looking into as well as to why why they're not being enforced, why they're not being applied properly, what maybe needs to change to do to make sure that happens. So all of that will be the what next category. Um, again, as part of that's so all the policy side of things, the industry has a really strong role in this. They have a very strong voice and a very strong capacity to change what's currently happening. So from our perspective, we're looking to work closely with industry on this to both mainstream decapod welfare so that it is a consideration for retailers as much as any other farmed animal welfare is but also to work with other aspects of industry and looking at how they can actually change what they're, what's currently happening to live decapods whilst it's in their particular part of the sea to plate supply chain and see what improvements can be made at that level, both voluntary and then ideally an enforceable code of practice to make sure that this is something that is going to be pushed through and is going to last the distance. It's not, it shouldn't be something that is down to an individual company's discretion. This should be something that is mandated um, and then is enforced in the same way as other animal welfare legislation is. Um, it's worth noting as well that the swift combination of the scientific review, um, I say swift, I use that term loosely when you look at the long, like how long this has actually taken, but the, the kind of conversion from it being the scientific review to the legal recognition of sentience in UK law is something that's going to have legal ramifications and wide ramifications around the world. There's a lot of other um, countries that are looking at this, whilst other countries, some countries do already have protections for decapods, actually can linking the two together of saying science says this, therefore the law should say that. 
actually linking those two together and for it happening so neatly um, is something that will actually have real significance. We've heard a lot from other organisations around the world as to what sort of impact they're hoping this will have in their country too. So I think the, it's very hard to under, understate the importance of the LSE report that was, per, that was published. Um, and again, as a sentience bill, legally recognising it as a result. Um, so with that, I will leave it at that. Thank you, Claire. Um, it was very um, informative to hear about um, what um, Crustacean Sentience is doing in this area and its views on the current legislation current state of things. Um, okay, um, I think everyone has presented already, so I would like to send um, huge thanks to all of our speakers for joining us and this evening and sharing your presentations with us. And we would like um, to turn to um, our Q&A. Um, so, and I would like to encourage anyone who has any more questions to um, put them in the Q&A box. Um, and the first question, I think it's um, directed at um, Callum. Um, do fish have a social hi hierarchy? If so, how it is determined? Yes, yeah, so it's, of course, it's very difficult to, to generalize across 36 odd thousand species of fish because some fish um, uh, basically hate other fishes. So that, you know, they're territorial and aggressive and all these sorts of things. But um, many, many fish, of course, uh, do have complex social relationships, whether even if it's aggressive, they can keep track of other individuals and, and these sorts of things. Uh, and in fact, we've recently been using, um, uh, I guess, analytical techniques that are most commonly applied to understanding uh, human uh, social relationships to understand fish and, and shark and, and ray social relationships as well. So we analyze their, their behavior and interactions in much the same way as you would if you were looking at somebody's Facebook page, um, how many likes and dislikes. And you can use that information to generate a social network uh, and you can overlay uh, what the interactions between each individual is too. So on top of that, you can say, well, this one's dominant over that one and so on and so forth. So our, our knowledge of the, the social lives and the complexity of, of the social lives of fishes is, is, is very extensive. And some species uh, have extremely complicated social lives. They, they keep track of social prestige. Uh, they, they have modes of reconciliation um, if social relationships break down. So it's extremely complicated. Um, but they, and they also use a range of senses. You know, they, they, they just display visually. They talk to one another literally by you know, um, verbal communication. Um, using all sorts of um, chemicals um, as well. So it's complicated, but uh, they have a very rich social life. Thank you, Callum. Thank you. And um, so Tom Norman asks uh, all the speakers generally, from both a philosophical and practical public policy point of view, what the speakers think about emphasizing basic rights for sea animals rather than trying to ban or limit the very worst welfare abuses. Um, anyone feel free to, to step forward here. Okay. Um, I think it's really interesting because we've just had the rights of nature recognized in Ecuador as extending to wild free living animals. So I think we have to, you know, start having taking a joined up approach to some of these issues don't we um there's a it's, a it's a huge conversation it's much larger than the one that we can have here we've obviously focused on wet welfare detriments um also in australia um there is a big push amongst the um Ian Robertson's group, Sentient Animal Law, to embrace positive animal welfare and duties extended beyond um, limiting cruelty or um, looking after the welfare of animals and preventing negative experiences to actually promoting positive experiences. So there are issues about how animal welfare legislation should develop and there are also issues about uh, the extent to which animals should have either legal rights or fundamental rights. Um, and they're really interesting and very difficult issues 
I think, yeah, um, I think one, of the, one of the issues that we've been tackling through Fairfish International and ASC is the development of welfare guidelines for aquaculture. Uh, and whilst I think there's a lot of agreement on trying to remove or stop, you know, obvious procedures that are, are causing distress, harm and anxiety and pain, um, what's much harder to agree upon is a, a proactive approach to um, positive animal welfare in fishers. And that, and that is partly because actually the science for positive animal welfare in fishers is nowhere near uh, as good as it is uh, in terms of looking at pain and anxiety and stress and, and those sorts of things. So that's, we're, we're currently pushing for you know, preventing the negative. Um, and I'm hoping that perhaps in the next 10 years or so, we might start to look at um, having some positive animal welfare uh, into those sort of guidelines as well. Do you think, um, you know, agreement and consensus is a very valuable thing in this area and is, and is what, what has driven the, the positive steps that have been taken? And, and the biggest points of consensus are around animal welfare. Um, as soon as you sort of shift the focus to sort of basic rights on the model of human rights, the consensus starts to fragment. So, I mean... Uh, Amro earlier was saying you know, 70% would support welfare protections for fish that are up to the level as they are for other farm animals. And that's something that it's really important to get such a significant majority like that. Um, you know, where, whereas support for, for fish rights, I wouldn't expect to be around the 70% mark. So what one has to bear these, these things in mind, I think, and try and, uh, try and take people, take people with us, I suppose. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the next question is from uh, Leanne, and, and it's a question from Amro, for Amro, sorry. Um, are you hopeful that the review conducted by Professor Griggs on licensing in the aquaculture sector in Scotland will include welfare recommendations um, relating to uh, fish and crustaceans, probably? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, short answer, I'm not too optimistic on it. So essentially, and um, for those who aren't aware, the Scottish government um, requested an external review of agriculture regulation. Um, and what we found, uh, we, we submitted evidence to that alongside other organizations and um, um, but found that we received a response that essentially was a bit dismissive, that uh, essentially seems to suggest that uh, fish welfare wasn't really high on the priorities of agriculture regulation. And that's something that we, we coordinated with a few other groups to, to write a letter to the Scottish government, to, to Barry Gouge and the Cabinet, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to say that, you know, I don't think you can have a reasonable uh, and, and full uh, review of external of, of agriculture regulation that, that looks at all the factors and not include uh, animal welfare in that it seems to be obviously uh, a constituent part that affects the business as well as as, as the animal side. Um, and yeah, long answer is that we basically got a response that seemed well that was quite dismissive of that. So we're still trying to push for them to take uh, animal welfare more seriously in the review. But thus far, what we've what we've heard isn't isn't very positive. Thank you, Amro. We have a question from Luke. I believe this was asked uh, during Colin's talk. Um, he is a vet student who's just finished a public health module. Um, the question is, what indicators should be used when assessing fish welfare? Many current OWIs seem to be focused on environmental aspects, such as water quality and stocking density, which seem crude and don't take into account the sentience and intelligence you've discussed. Yeah, so I, I kind of mentioned this um, before. We're, we're we're working with a number of uh, NGOs and 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 things like that to actually come up with a list of the sorts of things that one might use as welfare indicators. And, and traditionally, actually, if you look at this, um, most of them are, are health indicators, and that's kind of where the field has come from. Mm -hmm. And so, what we're trying to do now is come up with a, a, a much more complicated list of things. Uh, that one might look for uh, in terms of uh, welfare. Uh, 
for fishes in, in aquaculture. And it's, it's actually much more difficult than you might predict. And, and that's because um, there's, there's a fair bit of reluctance on behalf of the, uh, the industry to actively interact with their, their fish in, in, in ways that might uh, disturb the, the, the fish themselves and cause stress and anxiety. Um, but I, I think that improving our technological approaches to these questions will go some way to helping solve those things. So including things like uh, underwater cameras, so you can actually watch the fish doing various different behaviours. You can actually monitor whether they have lesions, how, what their fin conditions are like, what their body conditions are like, and those sorts of things. Um, uh, there's a quite a, a reluctance uh, to take a, an approach where you would actually take samples and send them away to, to the laboratories. So you, looking at cortisol, for example, uh, it's quite a straightforward thing to do, but it costs money and it takes time. Um, so there are all sorts of practical barriers uh, that the farmers themselves um, put forward. Um, so look, I think that's the, the sorts of things that we're looking at is, is really about you know, changes in behavior, changes in body condition uh, and these sorts of things. And I, I personally would like to take a more um, hands-on approach and take samples and send them off to labs. But I don't think that is going to get um, approval uh, more broadly from the industry. And most, you know, most of these companies that we're working with are working hand in hand with with big uh, uh, industry members trying to trying to make it practical and applicable wherever possible. So this, there are some compromises, um, which I guess is not all that surprising, but I suspect that animal uh, welfare will become a, a big thing in, in fish husbandry uh, in the very near future. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, the next question um, is a bit wider. Uh, Fom is asking, um, do the panelists have any views and they could share about any legal advances or lack thereof to address the intense overfishing of our oceans um, so that there are fish left to improve the welfare of? <laughs> I mean, these are important issues in relation to trade policy um, and international cooperation. And I think it's really encouraging to see the collaborative work that's going on between NGOs and many of the people who have referred to it. Um, and we have organisations like Aquatic um, Alliance for Animals who are you know, working really hard on these sorts of issues. I think it's probably too big an issue for us to cover in this talk today, um, but I think it needs international collaborative effort. I think one of the big problems with the fishing industry globally is that it's heavily subsidized by governments. So many of these industries just would not be economically viable if it were not for the input from, of literally dollars and various other subsidies. Um, and I think that means that we, we have the technology literally right now to go out and catch every fish in the ocean. Traditionally, you wouldn't have thought that possible. We actually have the technology to do that now. Um, but what we need to do, of course, is prevent those subsidies and, and make the value of wild caught fish actually representative of um, the true value and, and they should be seen as, as a unique commodity just in the, in the same way as you would pay extra for you know a wild caught deer or a wild caught uh, pig or something like that we need to th think of wild fish um, not as a, a thing that you harvest ad infinitum uh, with no um, you know cost to anybody but but rather as a precious resource that we need to um, protect uh, and recognize that it's true value. Mm. I think that's an interesting point, actually. And following on from that, I'd have a question um, for AMRO, where, whether you think that there's discussed, uh, certainly collaboration um, from uh, on campaigns with other groups, and whether you think that there's a potential for, for yourself to collaborate with um, environmental groups at all, because I think that certainly uh, the, the environmental issues do tend to resonate with the with a large group of the public, um, and I'm thinking what comes to mind is is um, the waste that comes from perhaps Scottish salmon fishing, uh, and and whether that's a potential um, area of focus or collaboration 
in the future for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to stay open to to anything that we that we can utilize to to, to make this case. Um, and I think you're right. You mentioned that environmental concerns sometimes are more. Uh, as they say, easy, but an easier way for people to connect with issues when they might necessarily connect with 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 animal welfare. So as we expand and move, hopefully move on to other campaigns and explore other areas, I think you'll be very open to exploring what the impacts are in other areas and the instrumental and knock on effects. Um, and then we kind of do that in other campaigns already, trying to look at what the pollution outcomes are or cost outcomes with, uh, you know, in terms of poultry farming, for example. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good suggestion. Interesting issue, isn't it? Because if the focus is um, humane slaughter, you can't, you know, introducing stunners and things like that, you can't really sell that on its environmental benefits, I would imagine. In the end, you've got to be able to make a case for animal welfare for its own sake. Uh, but it does seem like the vast majority of people respond to that. So, Yeah, just uh, to, to respond to that, I think you're absolutely right. And we have this kind of issue in, in, on lots of our campaigns and, and work about um how you well, what is the bottom line essentially um and you, you can talk about potentially potentially increasing costs for people and how does that relate to things and how does environmental impact affect impact but we have to be able to make the case that on its own basis whatsoever that animal welfare is important and we could we an animal cruelty essentially shouldn't uh is is the bottom line yeah. and i wonder if, if claire do you have anything um to mention on that subject at all? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely one that we find um, it's sometimes helpful as a door opener, in honesty, to see what else is currently um, being talked about or is currently kind of the, like the phrase, but or like theme of the day. So what's currently popular and how is it relevant to what we're doing? We can use that as a way to kind of start those conversations with people. But um, I very much agree um, that animal welfare for its own right and for its own, that is a purpose that's valid enough in its own right. And I think it's something that it's always worth, for our, we always try to bring it back to that level. But as much as we might be talking about the impact it might have in other reasons or other ways, or, or how it might be related to other issues that people care about but fundamentally, it is because these animals are animals, they are individuals, they have individual lived experiences, that that is worthy um, of protection, that that is worthy of consideration. And I think that's what it ultimately boils down to for most people, is that as much as as much as people do care about the bottom line, particularly now, and it, and it gets harder when you kind of look around what else is going on in the world, we kind of face that questioning sometimes as to, well, why should I care about a crab when this awful thing is happening over here or this terrible thing is happening over there? And it's, it's not an either-all situation. It is something where as long if there is positive progress being made, if it is something that is solving a problem, it doesn't have to be in competition with something else. So I think it's, it's you can definitely work towards multiple goals at the same time without losing focus as to what your central reason for doing what you're doing is. Um, and ultimately for us, it's that we're always kind of answerable to the decapods effectively, that as long as we're what we're doing and the decisions we're making will ultimately benefit them and, and will ultimately kind of lead to more humane treatment for them. That's kind of the ultimate um, our kind of ultimate measure of success yeah it's an important human value i would say and a you know a british value certainly and um people talk about it's part of our identity as a as a society and as human beings so sometimes people talk about human interests versus animal interests and how do we weigh these conflicting things and i think to some extent that's the wrong way to think about it because one of our human interests is to live in the kind of society where we feel as though we have a, a relationship of respect to the animals around us. And that, that is a human interest that the vast majority of people in this country want to be answered. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't come into conflict with animal interests. Great. <sighs> uh, thank you so much. Um, I, um, I think one last question from me. Um, I have a question to Jonathan and Callum, uh, considering your research um, in this field of uh, crustacean sentience and fish, sen fish sentience. What was the most surprising uh, finding you have come across in relation to the sentience of these animals? What was like the most shocking thing um, you have discovered? Uh, 
Oh, gosh, um, I guess I can go first. Um, look, uh, t- to me, um, I- I've always personally felt that uh, fishes were far more clever than we you know, gave them credit for ever since I was a little kid. Um, but that doesn't mean that I haven't continuously been surprised by some of the findings we've had. And I think um, perhaps some of the more memorable uh, experimental setups are, are what really grabs my attention. And this is where you, you, know, you manipulate the animals in such a way that they, they give you an answer by, by watching their behavior. And some really good examples of that are where um, fish are, are shown to, to self-medicate, uh, which I think is amazing. So if you give a fish a, a choice between a, a barren environment and, and, and a complex environment, of course, they like to spend time in the complex environment. But the question is then if, if you give them a, a painful stimulus or an injection of a slight acetic acid or something like that, uh, and then you put um, some analgesia in, in the barren room, they completely change their, their preference, right? And, and so they move from, and they ignore the complex environment now and they, they spend time self-medicating uh, in, in the barren environment. And these sorts of experiments where, where fish are obviously making complicated um, decisions to trade off one need versus another, uh, to me is really compelling that, that there's so much going on in these animals' minds and, and we really are only just starting to understand how to extract that information. But I, I really find that I, that these experiments where you titrate you know, one need over, over another um, is really a fascinating way of trying to understand what, what an animal needs and what it wants and what it's willing to work for. And it's, it's pretty obvious from the work that's been done on, on both crustaceans and on fishes that they really are willing to work uh, to avoid pain and stress and anxiety. So those things are obviously important to them and, and more important than living in a complicated uh, environment, which we know has compelling welfare implications in its own right. So I think for me, th- those have been the most uh, amazing uh, experimental uh, results. Surprising for me was the anxiety like states in crayfish. Oh. Excellent. Thank you. It's been a really fantastic event. Um, thank Nadia and Mary for putting everything together and Tiffany for all her really hard work behind the scenes, um, liaising with everyone and the fantastic social media presentations you've been doing as well behind the scenes as well. It has been really excellent. Um, so I'll hand over to you both to close, but thank you to all our speakers for their time. Um, early morning and late evening (laughs) thank you all yeah I I echo that huge thank you everyone and I think I've thoroughly enjoyed this event I'm sure everyone has and it's just given such a broad overview and an in-depth an in-depth overview of everything that that we wanted it to cover so um, as we mentioned uh, this event has been recorded um, and we'll share all the details um, and links and also any uh, presentations as well that we can in due course. Um, thank you everyone for all of your all of your help and all of your effort. Um, I'll pass over to Nadia if you have any any final any final words. No, I completely agree with you. I'm very thankful for everyone to for joining us tonight. And this was a very uh, pleasant and informative event. I'm sure we all learned a lot from it. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.